All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first installation of the 40th anniversary conference series of the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, or APOC. Uh, my name is Kyoteru Tsutsui, and I'm the uh, director of the Japan program at APOC. Um, the Japan program is delighted to kick off the 40th anniversary series uh, with a conference entitled The Future of Social Tech, Nurturing Skills on Markets for Innovation with Social Impact. Uh, for the Japan program, this is the first major in-person conference since the COVID outbreak, and we are very excited to be able to welcome you to this event. And I'm particularly grateful for all the heroic efforts by our staff, uh, which enabled us to welcome such a stellar lineup of speakers today. Uh, we will have four exciting panels featuring speakers who are rock stars in their fields of investment, science, education, democracy, digital media, and diplomacy. And as you know, we will also have a real rock star, Yoshiki, uh, at the last uh, keynote panel. And I, uh, I'd like to get started with some warm welcoming remarks from two very important people who made it possible for us to hold this uh, important conference today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Professor Gi Wok Shim, the director of APOC, who has uh, overseen the growth of our center for much of the second half of the four decades of APOC's existence as director. Uh, in addition to being director of APOC, he's also director of the career program at APOC, uh, William J. Perry Professor of Contemporary Career and Professor of Sociology. So please join me in welcoming Gi Wok Shim to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. So this winter has been a little strange uh, in terms of weather. Uh, I think a lot of rain and very windy uh, last uh, couple of uh, days. But now we see uh, sky, I mean, very nice uh, you know, sun coming out. And as Gio mentioned, uh, this is uh, our inaugural event. Uh, in celebrating our 40th anniversary uh, of our center, and I'm director, uh, Giyuk Shin, or Shin Giyuk. Uh, and as you know, uh, our center uh, is a Stanford hub for addressing critical issues affecting the countries of Asia, their regional and global affairs, and U.S.-Asia relations. So our center was you know, founded in 1983 by uh, several uh, scholars uh, on campus who believed that uh, Asia was ready for a takeoff that would transform uh, American national interests. So think about uh, 1983. It was the twilight of the Cold War. China was opening uh, to the world. And Japan was fast uh, arriving as the world's uh, second uh, largest economy. So actually, I came to the uh, United States in the same year, in 1983, uh, for graduate school. I still remember that it's, it's all about Japan in the 1980s. I mean, no one really mentioned about China or Korea. It's all about Japan. So therefore, in early years, our center uh, naturally uh, focused on you know, Japan. So almost like a big one as a Japan center, uh, in early days. And we have done uh, you know, many projects and meetings and uh, sort of you know, policy engagement, uh, like uh, research on political economy of Japan, uh, US-Japan high-tech uh, competition and security collaboration. Also, we have done projects on uh, historical, historical, historical memories uh, in Northeast Asia, uh, including Japan. <coughs> also, uh, we convened uh, U.S.-Japan congressional seminars with uh, U.S. Senate and Japanese uh, Thai members. We also uh, worked with the city of Kyoto uh, to host uh, annual dialogue on, on Asia-Pacific uh, issues. So today, uh, under the, uh, the, the leadership of Professor uh, Kyo Jutsui, 
the Japan program uh, carries the charge forward. Uh, the program cultivates uh, multidisciplinary social science oriented research and education to promote a comprehensive understanding of the internal uh, external factors that influence uh, Japan's development and its role in the region and on the world stage. So Japan program is one of uh, six uh, thriving uh, research program uh, in, at the center. And over the winter and spring uh, quarters, uh, we are celebrating and reflecting on our achievement uh, over the last 40 years and then thinking about the future direction. So we titled uh, Asia in 2030, uh, APAC at 40. So please uh, visit our website uh, for more uh, specific uh, information on, on the programs. So today, uh, once again, I'm very happy to uh, launch uh, our celebration uh, with this, this conference on the future of social in a tech. And I'd like to thank uh, Kyo uh, for uh, you know, organizing and you know, really uh, promoting uh, this conference. And you know, Kyo also uh, direct, uh, deputy director of our center as well as directing uh, Japan program. So I think uh, in my view, uh, our center has uh, three missions. One is uh, research, uh, education, and outreach or policy engagement. So we continue uh, our cutting edge uh, research on Japan and other parts of Asia. Also, we are trying to nurture the next generation of scholars working on Asia. And then we engage uh, scholars, experts, and policymakers uh, in Washington, in Tokyo, and other uh, parts of Asia. So once again, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, excellent and stimulating uh, discussion and presentation. So, uh, you know, welcome again. Then I'll turn to uh, Kyo uh, for uh, introducing our next speaker. So, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you, Georg. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, Consul General Yasushi Noguchi, who is uh, the Consul General of Japan in San Francisco, who has kindly agreed to uh, give us some warm, welcoming remarks for the occasion. Uh, the Consul General's office in San Francisco has been critical for the growth of the Japan program, as it has generously supported a number of um, important activities for the program, such as student exchanges, research initiatives, conferences and workshops, uh, and other educational and programming engagements. And we're particularly grateful um, to him for coming down to Stanford today when he has to um, attend Emperor's Birthday Ceremony in San Francisco in a couple hours. Um, so please give him a warm welcome up to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tsutsuji Sensei, for your kind introduction. It is a great honor for me uh, to join the inaugural conference on the occasion of Schorenstein APAC's 40th anniversary. I would like to offer my sincere congratulations to APAC director Ji uh, Shin and Japan program director Kiyoteru Tsutsui, both whom we have had the pleasure of working closely with, the, with the, in the past. As we commemorate this significant milestone, it is fitting for today's theme to focus on social tech, which aims to accelerate innovation for social impact. I believe that as a Japanese person, we are raised with the mindset to always being mindful of how our actions impact others in society. And this underlying cultural trait extends into our professional lives, impacting the way we approach all aspects of business and the environment. I think many people around the world 
are also taking this approach. Regardless of the type of challenge, from climate change to education to digital media, uh, society seeks solutions that balance benefiting people and the planet. I'm proud that I can represent Japan here in the United States, two countries with a long record of developing successful technological achievements. And today, I look forward to hearing your solutions to these pressing social problems and how our two countries can lead the world into the future. In closing, I wish to express my congratulations to APAC on this milestone anniversary and wish the organization and its leaders continued success. And just as this inaugural conference symbolizes new initiatives and beginnings, it is my hope that next 40 years is as impactful as the first 40. Additionally, later today, I know we will end the conference with a bang as Yoshiki and former Japanese ambassador to the United States, Ichiro Fujisaki, close out the last session. Thank you again for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Consul General Noguchi. Uh, now I'd like to briefly lay out the main goals of this conference. Uh, as referenced earlier, this conference kicks off the APAC's 40th um, anniversary conference series entitled Asia in 2030, APAC at 40. And in thinking about Asia in 2030, the Japan program seeks to explore what Japan might offer in the year 2030. Uh, and in, in Japan, various opinion leaders have discussed the most uh, desirable direction for Japan in the coming decade. And if there's one consistent theme, it is that Japan needs to revive its economy by stimulating more new ventures, startups, that use technological innovations to offer new services and products. And these new ventures might make profits and offer value to customers, but many argue that they should also develop innovations that have social impact, not just economic impact, and seek to solve global problems such as climate change, pandemic, natural disasters, economic inequality, political divide, and racial and uh, gender inequity. And these innovations with social impact, which we like to call social tech, would make great contributions to the world. And Japan, with its significant human resources and investment capacity, uh, can once again become the leader of technological innovations and regain its economic clout, and also become a positive force in the divided world. Uh, this is a wonderful scenario for Japan in 2030, uh, but few have offered clear pathways for success uh, in this direction. And with that in mind, this conference boldly seeks to find ways forward for enti uh, entities in Japan and the US to develop social tech. And we'll examine questions such as uh, how new developments in financial markets could contribute to climate change goals, how design thinking, arts and music, sports and other interactive approaches could infuse creativity in STEM fields to inspire innovation. How could we utilize digital technologies to improve democracy, not to damage democracy? How could content creators cross national borders and break language barriers to succeed in global markets, perhaps using new media platforms, and enhance well-being of people all over the world? Uh, these are questions that will be addressed in each of the four panels, respectively. And we would also like all the panelists to discuss a couple of additional questions. Uh, what are the skills that we should be nurturing today if we want the next generation to develop innovations with social impact? And what could prompt entrepreneurs to aspire for bigger, more global impact rather than to stay in their local domains? Uh, to address these questions, we are very fortunate to have leading innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, content creators, researchers, and educators here to reflect uh, reflect on their path forward, uh, path towards successes, as well as failures along the way. And they will discuss how best to nurture skills and environments that are conducive to social tech. 
Now, to get us started, uh, I'd like to invite the panelists for the first session to come up to the stage. And I will hand the microphone over to the moderator of the first panel, Yasumasa Yamamoto. Uh, yes, Yasumasa Yamamoto, Yasu uh, Yamamoto is a visiting professor at Kyoto University Graduate School of Management uh, with years of experience at Google, Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, UFJ, and other companies. He has deep expertise in new technologies such as fintech, blockchain, and deep learning. Uh, and he has written on how to understand and use those technologies in a number of many, many books published in Japanese. And he will introduce the two speakers of the first panel. So Yasu, please take it away. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Kyo, for a kind introduction. Um, hi, my name is Yasu Yamamoto. I'm the, doing the moderator for this uh, first uh, session for, for this event. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, first uh, Ms. Reiko Hayashi to the, uh, to the stage. Um, she's the director and de deputy president of B of A Security Japan, Bank of America Group. Uh, she oversees the firm's in interaction with regulators and the government department in Japan, and is responsible for overseeing the government framework across the business. She is also responsible for driving sustainable finance client initiatives for the business. As chair of the Japan Philanthropy Committee and co-chair of the LGBT Pride Employee Network in Japan, please welcome. Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah. Okay. Hi. The, the next morning. great uh, panelist is uh, Professor Gretchen Dairy. Um, yeah. She's she just arrived. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hope she's okay. Uh, okay, so th th her background is she's a co founder and faculty director of the Natural Capital Project, which aims to integrate the value of nature into policy and management by providing accessible scientific tools, which includes INVEST. Uh, data and software platform used in 185 countries. She's also a being professor of environmental science, the director of, of the Center for Cons Conservation Biology, and the senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Her research focus, focuses on human dependence and impacts on nature and transformation. Welcome, uh, Professor Gretchen Derry. Thank uh, you. So today, yeah, thank you. So today, uh, she had uh, uh, some problem with the back pain, so she will stand at the, by the podium. So, so, <laughs> so she will start by, uh, with the, the her presentation first, around 15 minutes, and then uh, Rego has stand 15 minutes, you then start first. we do the panel discussion. Oh, oh, uh, you, oh maybe. Vice you, versa? Okay. Maybe vice versa. Okay, I will be there. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you, you can. Keep standing stand over there, right or next to me, okay. <laughs> as you like. It's your turn. <laughs> click one, this one. Yes. I have to check how to use it beforehand. Okay. Mm. It seems I can, I can manage. Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. It's a great honor to be the first speaker uh, the first panelist today, such an inaugural uh, 40th anniversary of this center. I'm so happy and I'm so honored again. Uh, so thank you very much for introducing me, uh, Yasu. And, but let me briefly explain what I am doing here. Uh, okay. I'm going to talk about sustainable finance today. Maybe some of you have heard of uh, ESG, maybe every day we see the word of ESG, sustainable finance, uh, green washing, so on. These days it's a hot topic across the globe. And then I have been in charge of sustainable finance around seven, eight years from now as an employee of Bank of America. But uh, please look at my uh, brief summary. So I have been in the capital market business more than 30 years, I started working with Yas Kaneko, who is sitting there <laughs> as my former boss at BNP Paribas. Uh, he is now uh, living in uh, uh, this area. It's a, 
it's a big surprise again, but anyway. So I've been in the capital markets for 30 years and I'm involved in sustainable finance. And then because of that, now I'm a board member of International Capital Market Association, which is a self-regulatory body which sets green bond principles or social bond principles, uh, which means what is green, what is social, to make clarity in the market participants. And then also uh, I work for several working groups set by uh, Japanese government to, uh, to promote sustainable finance in Japan. Recently, I was a member of a GX Transformation Council, GX Jiko Kaigi, set by the cabinet. So uh, with my experience, I like to update what's going on in sustainable finance in the capital markets, and then also uh, what's the hot topics there, and what Japan government is doing and then what the remaining areas to be solved going forward. ESG is evolving. Look at this chart. ESG market started in 2013. It's, it's still new market, but at the beginning, the market was very small. And then in the past several years, the market has grown quite rapidly. And then ICMA has set uh, green bond principles in 2014, and then since then they set up social bond principles, sustainability bond principles, and so on. And the market grew around one trillion US dollar in 2021. And then last year, uh, due to COVID-19, due to the higher rate, and then also geopolitical tension, the market uh, became a bit smaller, but still it proved the resilience of the market in comparison with the conventional market. And look at the chart. Uh, the market has been uh, led by European market participants mainly, but these days uh, US and then, Amer and then Asian uh, are also growing. And then also public sector and then private sectors are also uh, utilizing this market to deploy the money to uh, sustainable finance. Uh, this is, uh, those are the principles set by uh, ICMA. Uh, most of the ESG transactions, like 1980% uh, of the bonds are uh, uh, aligned with bond principles set by ICMA. I'm so proud of that. I, talk, I talked about the issuer side, but also investors are growing in interest, being interested in sustainable finance. Looking at this chart, the growth of flow funds uh, can be seen, and then also even under the uh, current tough situation, still sustainable finance uh, investment is more uh, featured than conventional investment. Okay. Hot topics. ESG was uh, basically, uh, originally it was featured to improve environment and then also uh, to improve social issues. But these days it's more political matters, to be honest. And then uh, last year, uh, US uh, introduced the Inflationary Inflation Reduction Act and then also EU uh, implemented the Power EU impact. As highlighted in yellow, uh, ESG is related to energy securities as well. So it's getting more political, but, but still uh, there are so many uh, issues to be solved, but uh, these are the uh, current uh, phenomena. And then interestingly, uh, EU, uh, EU taxonomy, maybe you don't know about EU taxonomy, but it's a category which is sustainable and not sustainable. And then uh, recently, uh, EU included nuclear and gas as sustainable uh, energy. And then there are still a lot of uh, uh, controversial discussion in the market participants, but this has been recently implemented. And then also greenwashing. Uh, since the market has grown so rapidly, there are so many transactions which are not green. For example, very interesting example, there was a green transaction for uh, trains. Trains are regarded as 
uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, because uh, they are using electric uh, electricity, but they brought coals on trains. It's a great, a big, a good example of greenwashing. And then the SEC recently investigated uh, our peers, and then they, uh, they the, some peers uh, paid some penalties. And greenwashing, social washing, uh, the hot topics in the market. And then in order to avoid this, we have to make more uh, transparent disclosure, and then uh, investors and financial institutions should be careful uh, what we're doing in a pro uh, where, whether we are doing in an appropriate manner. Japan, what are we doing? Where to go? Japan, uh, we are uh, one of the uh, countries which will be affected by the recent geopolitical tension. Why? Uh, Japan primary energy self-efficiency ratio is the lowest among G7 countries. Look at the number. Uh, Japan uh, in uh, self-sufficiency ratio is just 11%. So we have to find out the way how to be independent uh, from uh, on uh, energy resources. As you know, the prime, uh, ex Prime Minister Suga uh, declared uh, carbon net zero by 2050. And then since then, uh, there are several working groups set up to achieve this net zero. And then I have been uh, a, members, a member of several uh, working groups, and we are still working on uh, many issues. Uh, one interesting topic uh, last year, uh, no, the two years ago already, uh, corporate governance code was revised. And one of the topic is that the sustainability and then ESG elements should be uh, included in our corporate disclosure. And the second one, it's also interesting. Uh, it, it says that we have to promote diversity. Diversity and then inclusion is one of the important topic for Japanese uh, society. And then Japanese corporates is are uh, now supposed to uh, disclose what we are doing to promote diversity and an inclusion, not only female, but also uh, non-Japanese people and so on. Hopefully, uh, this will uh, accelerate uh, the diversity and inclusion situation in Japan. Another one, uh, I, I've just touched upon uh, energy uh, issues in Japan. Japan uh, is heavily relying on, on fossil fuel uh, energy. And then in, in Europe, the choice is just renewable. But can we do that in Japan? We have so many utility companies or energy companies or steel companies, uh, manufacturing companies. So we need to transform those business to be decarbonized in a gradual manner. Look at the, uh, the, 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 the cover page of the handbook set by uh, ministries, METI, uh, Ministry of Environment, and then the FSA. The goal is high. We have to go to the uh, uh, summit by various uh, manners. And then in order to promote this, uh, we set the handbook to promote climate transition. And then thanks to that, uh, already we have seen some initiatives by Japan Airline, JERA, Tokyo Gas, uh, uh, Kawasaki Line, and then and then so on to, uh, to, to change their business by utilizing uh, uh, capital markets. And then also Mr. Kishida uh, announced that they are going to do green transition bond in 2023 at the earliest time. And then we need uh, 150 trillion yen to promote uh, this uh, initiative in 10 years. Uh, final part. COP15, uh, uh, Gretchen is going to talk about nature uh, importance, but uh, in November last year, we had COP15 uh, to talk about uh, uh, biodiversity. This is another uh, topic uh, in ESG area. And then five takeaways here. Uh, there are several takeaways, but I like to uh, call out that 
Number one, nature-related risks have emerged as a material issue for companies. And number four, more data and tools to assist corporate performance in the actions on nature are becoming available. And then several other new business initiatives were launched, including, I missed putting that, but there are several initiatives that are going on. Uh, today's topic is uh, so, social tech. And then uh, to promote the business, or in order to avoid greenwashing or social washing, we need data. We need uh, quantification of the impact. And then having those data, we can, we can have uh, more ideas to which direction we should invest. And then also we need technologies to promote decarbonization like uh, carbon uh, capture technologies or uh, CCS or other technologies to promote sustainable uh, future to pass to the ge next generation. Uh, that concludes my presentation and I'd like to hand over to Gretchen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next is uh, um, Professor Gretchen Derry's presentation. Thank you so much, everybody. <clears throat> Can you hear just yes. well? Thank you. I'm, I'm so inspired um, by all that the Japan program has done over all these years and very honored to take part in this celebration and convening and hopefully really rich conversation today. And um, just to be clear, I'm standing because I had a back injury a couple days ago. And so sorry, I'll be awkwardly at this side during our conversation. Um, I'm really inspired by all that Bank of America is leading, thanks to Rico's great insights and efforts, and I'd, I'd like to play off of those in um, kind of opening a conversation together with all of us here. Um, so I've been coming at the problem from where she left off, um, that more and more companies are recognizing nature-related risks as material for their operations and uh, you know, really core to the future. Um, also recognizing how much we need data and real information to help guide decision making, whether it's in investment or other um, really key decisions that we need to take across society in um, public and private sectors. So I'll give you a little bit of a um, just background on what's happening on the nature-related side of things. In the context that we're discussing today, climate is ahead in many ways as an issue. Um, there's been uh, maybe a 25-year head start by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel or Program on, on Climate Change that has helped um, organize scientific um, and social and other research on the impacts of climate change and what we can do to mitigate those and hopefully avoid you know, the worst possible impacts. And all of that is just starting about 25 years delayed for different reasons of how academia works and how um, leadership happened to occur and things like that. But now there's tremendous momentum in this area of valuing nature and decision making and um, more and more opportunity to integrate the advances that have been made in um, decision making all across many sectors and regions of the world. So a quick overview. Um, the idea here is to uh, recognize that nature is an, a fundamental engine of prosperity. That's sort of an understatement. We couldn't live on any other known planet, and um, so it's fundamental to everything. Um, we often talk about nature in terms of natural capital, and that was by design initially. It has nothing to do with capitalism or any system like that. It just has to do with there being a stock of nature in the form of lands, waters, and all of the life that lives within our lands and waters that together provides a flow of benefits to people. 
So we need to keep our eye on both the stock and the flow, just like you do <laughs> in finances. Um, and one way to look at it is around the world, you know, we've seen the planet dramatically transformed. Um, and the open question is, you know, how much and where should we protect given how little, you know, rainforest remains and how rapid deforestation is continuing? Um, second, how can we secure people and nature? What, um, you know, with this, seems like at one level kind of a trivial question. At another level, this is the most challenging question humanity has ever faced given the path that we're on. How can we secure both people and nature through policy, through finance, through um, you know, the way we operate and the way we think, our mindsets, our orientation? And, um, and then finally, a, a big question I'll throw out is, how do we move to better metrics for guiding, you know, tracking progress and guiding action? Right now, um, as everybody knows, GDP is mostly blind to nature, and we need a way of tracking not only economic performance, but also the ecological uh, performance of places on which we all depend. So how do we value nature? We started with um, very little known on this, but uh, this wonderful person that many of you might know or have known, Ken Arrow, uh, based at Stanford and working often in Sweden, that's the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, um, and across the world really opened up the knowledge foundation in a way that brought a lot of credibility and um, excitement and engagement in integrating what we need to value nature, and then into real decision making. A bunch of countries got going by the mid-90s. Costa Rica is shown here and really stood out as making pioneering um, policy changes to harmonize people and nature. Actually said, okay, up to now we've normally valued forest only when the trees are dead, when they're cut. And that's just crazy. The main value in trees, as people know well in Japan, you know, in many places, and we know in our hearts, comes from all that they do for us when living. And um, so they started paying people, literally, to conserve and restore forest. And the program was so successful, um, it's now been replicated all over the world. Another example back in those days was New York City to take you know, a forest case and then in the heart of a big, meg a big city, recognizing that water security and health depended on the upstream activities of farmers and others living about 100 or 150 miles north of the city and investing in those communities to change practices in a way that would benefit everybody. So here, the cows that you see in this dairy operation are in a solar heated tent that New York City provided that keeps the cows much healthier than they would be if they were running around um, in, and, and taking shelter in the beautiful but old New England barns that are much less healthy. So it was a, it was a combined approach of um, protecting nature and protecting animals in it that we integrate into our lives. Um, from disease that, that could be easily transmitted to us. So there were many other cases and the time came to try to systematize a universal approach. And that's when we launched um, through Stanford this natural capital project that now is a whole suite of, of partners working together to drive research innovation in how to value nature together with partners in many different sectors. So in drinking water supply, in maintaining trees across landscapes for flood control benefits, for carbon sequestration and climate security, for hydropower production, because looking at the Costa Rica picture, um, having forest provides, it's like a sponge that slowly releases water and allows you to generate 
hydropower or irrigation supply or drinking water year round, not only in the um, heavy rainfall months. And many other examples. Um, and with respect to data, the bottom part is this platform that provides data uh, for the world on every part of Earth's surface. Um, it's an open source, free platform. And today, uh, we're working primarily in the public sector with these different banks, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, the United Nations, many different parts of it, and central banks. Um, but there's a lot of movement toward what RICO is leading, and we need to uh, merge. That's where a lot of the innovation needs to take place in connecting these systems. But right now we're connecting through the public sector banks because they have a mission of serving the public, of harmonizing people in nature. That's their kind of core mission today, and they've all pledged to focus on that mission of, for a nature-positive future. So at the heart of it and where the data and platform lie is in this um, system called INVEST um, for integrated valuation of these ecosystem service benefits, the flow of benefits from nature in many different um, kind of arenas. So here I just show a few behind each one of these panels. The idea is to show where and how much nature is needed to offer coastal protection, to supply clean water and energy, to achieve flood control and protection, to um, provide food on a sustainable and healthy basis, to um, enable urban cooling as we have ever um, more extreme heat events in cities uh, and provide climate security generally. And then I'm going to get into health as a specific example just for, for fun. But that's the aim is where, to indicate where and how much to protect and who will benefit and how to ensure more of an inclusive, just approach. So this has been adopted in most countries. And uh, we've just recently pointing to data again with the data availability now ever more at fine, fine scales. We've developed a version of Invest for cities. And that's now just being tested and adopted across cities. So we're working in a lot of contexts all across the world. And um, I'll give you one example. That, and this is the tricky part where we have to connect to the decision making of investors, say, in the banking and finance sector, all the way through to literally land stewardship. You know, what's happening is our planet staying the b beautiful blue and green ball, the living system and biosphere that we're intimately a part of. So similar to the New York case, many cities worldwide depend on upstream areas for their water supply, for downstream industry, for drinking, for downstream irrigation or hydropower. And the upstream people who, um, whose activities determine whether we're getting that flow of clean, secure water year round, they live a world apart. So this is a picture from Colombia. The gentleman on, on the left lives up in a Quechua-speaking region, uh, hundreds of kilometers away from the people sort of indicated in the photos on the right. And it's a matter of making that connection and designing, here I just show monetary flow, but there needs to be a suite of institutions that get built. And that's what everybody's trying to create now to guide investments in those communities that shift their practices, harmonize what they're doing more. So that gentleman is not only producing beef and dairy products, but he's also producing water security for all these downstream uses. How do we assure that? The um, first questions that come up are even, can we define which activities and where in the watershed we should invest to achieve the necessary you know, outcomes for water security for all. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of square kilometers of watershed in the slope of the 
and these and things. So it's not an easy question to answer. But what we've developed with all of these scientists, more than you know, something like 2,000 have contributed to this um, open source platform, is a way of looking at any system, like these are a suite of watersheds, each purple shape is a watershed. So that means any drop of water that falls within one shape goes to a common place. And the common place typically nowadays is a city. And we see that city at the top, Tuluá, in, in um, this valley in Colombia. And <clears throat> here I'm showing the watershed where the top is the upper mountain ridge line. And we see there's an investment portfolio that comes from the software that shows you all the science that's in the software, where you would invest. We should protect on that ridge line for the most efficient, cost-effective way of achieving water security. We should reforest where we have blue. We should add trees, silvopasture, in the grasslands where we have that yellow, and so on. And this approach, I'm just showing you the very surface of it, lets you map out for any place and any budget level how much improvement you expect to achieve um, and, and we can play it out through time. It takes time to grow trees. But um, this is the kind of approach that's being developed for many, many, many of the benefits of nature to people. And this has been adopted by the gentleman speaking there is the recently former head of the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and the others there, that was the head of the Nature Conservancy and a gentleman high in politics in the Mexican government. And then um, myself and a partner who runs the Natural Capital Project together with many others. But they've agreed to a standardized approach and begun implementing it. And there are now 55 cities, including most of the major um, capital cities in Latin America that have adopted this approach. So it's just one little example to get your mind flowing that we need to connect the muddy ecosystems and the hard labor of the stewards out there and their livelihoods, their dignity, their appreciation in society with um, those who make investments and you know, drive water use for all the different purposes. So that's one example. Another, that was at a tiny scale. I'll say this has also been adopted at a huge scale. So across China after they, well, for a, quite a while, we've been working together about 15 years, building up to adding ecological as a core pillar to the Chinese constitution. And um, now seeing today that half of the country has been zoned just the way that small area was zoned that I showed you in Colombia for provision of the flow of benefits from a natural capital or you know, nature, the stock of nature, the healthier regenerating ecosystems. And in China, it was motivated by these primary services that I list here. And then in localities, there are often like 20 more, you know, mushroom production or medicinal plant production or all kinds of other local benefits that local people specify. But at the national scale, um, these are the primary benefits around which the country has been zoned. And in these zones, people are paid to, and that's the way of harmonizing people and nature. They receive payments to change practices in alignment with the broader needs of society, um, hopefully for a win-win. And we've, there's a huge amount of work going on to help ensure it's a win-win. And now, just this year, and I'll kind of close with this and one more thought. Um, we have um, the United Nations Global Environment Facility inviting us to scale up through many countries. We've worked in about 80 countries, but now we're trying to really build and develop capacity in sets of 15 countries at a time. So with the development banks, the Asian, Inter-American, World Bank, and African development banks, they've chosen the countries. They've agreed to finance plans that come from using this kind of natural capital approach. And it was only last week when I injured my back that we launched this um, project. And um, 
it here and it, it looks very exciting. All of these countries um, are different, will have different starting points, huge amount of innovation and capacity development that is underway, but plans that will emerge and that the banks are agreeing to finance. And then I was going to get into health, but I think I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I'll just show you briefly the, well, how much time should I, should I take? Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. It's basically, we know in cities that there's a tremendous need for nature. There's um, most of humanity living in cities, much less time in nature, and all our time really indoors and on devices. And we know there's a huge increase in anxiety and mood and other disorders that relate to depression and mental health problems. And what we found, I was going to show that, um, I'll leave that. We did a study here showing that if you walk in a natural area nearby, you do much better than if you walk um, just along that street, El Camino. It's not a horrible megacity street, it has trees, but it's amazing. We um, had people do these funny tests where you do a math problem and remember letters. And the people who walk in that little natural area remember way more. So it's both cognitive functioning and emotional well-being go way up if you take time to experience nature and you have the luxury of being able to go out where you live and work and experience nature. So it improves all these things and there have been hundreds of studies on this now. Yeah, it also like immune function. If you look at kids, this is here in um, in uh, Finland, where there's a ton of nature, but people live in high rises. The kids go to these schools that until recently, and more and more actually, they have this gravel, no like healthy soil that the kids touch, but they run around on gravel, or more and more there's ground up tires, uh, which is really sad, but it's sort of bouncy, and maybe people think it's a good place to throw away ground up tires, and kids can bounce. <laughs> but the people found if you take blood samples of the kids before and after this intervention of adding grass, adding that little planter box, do you see that little, um, um, that little square in the bottom right middle is where they can plant a few vegetables or those little black things are logs from the forest and then you take a blood sample six weeks later their immune function has gone way up. So there are tons of studies coming out like this on many pathways, also looking at physical activity. So many pathways connecting nature experience causally with human health and the benefits of, of health, mental and physical. But finally, I'll just close on this point. We're trying to integrate all of this into a new um, metric that would go alongside GDP. And it, um, like GDP, it just sums up all the goods and services for GDP and the economy, you know, multiplying their quantity by price, basically. And in <clears throat> the whole biosphere, we're going to um, sum up all the benefits from nature to people, all the goods and services that we get from ecosystems multiplied by their value and be able to track not only then economic performance of countries like we do with GDP, but ecological performance. Of, it can be countries, it could be any place. And this is really taking off. It sort of shows you, you know, where the benefits originate, how much there is, and to whom they flow. And um, it's got all the data, it's a lot of uses, and it's been approved by the UN. And um, this is taking off now around the world. And I'll just close saying it's a moment really to look at uh, the work being led by RICO um, and to see how can we connect across, you know, we're both working away in our different areas and it's time for all that social innovation <laughs> to enable us to connect and, um, and accelerate the transformation. That's it. Thank you so much.
about this program. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen, Thank for you. a great, uh, uh, very interesting uh, research. And I think uh, the key is uh, data and the communication between the each sectors. <coughs> and as uh, Reiko pointed <coughs> out, data is really important. And I think there are so many technology and startups to emerge, such as uh, satellite image and also the um, AI that can analyze the data. And I'd like to ask Reiko about uh, how you think about this uh, communication between the sectors and also initiatives from the, uh, this kind of United Nations, the World, World Bank. Uh, do you think that's, that's sustainable or we need more improvement for that? So actually, uh, when I talk about the growth of a gr uh, green bond market, mm -hmm. uh, the trigger, one of the trigger was the United Nations uh, Paris Agreement and then mm -hmm. also SDGs. Yeah. So the initiative by the supranational and then also uh, governmental uh, initiatives are uh, one of the triggers. And then uh, private sectors are stepping in right. the initiatives. Mm. And then so if we have a good data and then also some decision by policy makers, then uh, uh, private sectors will focus on or look at that. And then also you show already some evidence how powerful, mm. for example, nature has. And then actually, we, we are seeing some startups already mm. uh, talking about this in mm. Asia, for example. Mm. So things have already started. So I think that there should be some momentum going forward. Mm. But we should raise our voices further going mm. forward mm. in capital markets or in financial mm. society, but also in governmental mm. area as mm. well. Mm. Great, thank you. So uh, I'd like to ask Gretchen about what do you expect from the finance or other sectors? What do you need more communication or what do you need for more framework, more participation from other sectors? Thank you, that's a great question. Can everybody hear okay? Yep. Um, so basically what we've found is really useful. You've mm. touched on it all. It's partly developing a framework mm. that will work within a, you know, part of the private sector. Right but recognizing that we need to develop ever more of a universal mm -hmm. kind of framework. So um, making that innovative step right. of coming up mm -hmm. through the Bank of America, this mm -hmm. is how we could approach this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, within these frameworks that are emerging. And then um, secondly is developing actual use cases. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Mm, We're, case. for example, working with Morgan Stanley mm. now to um, connect uh, exactly what you were touching on, the mm. AI and the yeah. data, right. um, using high-resolution satellite imagery right. yeah. and asset locations. We can identify um, more and more, this is what we're advancing, mm. the dependence and the impact of any asset based on its likely activities. And with Morgan Stanley, we can mm. learn what the activities are for many thousands of assets. <clears throat> and um, this use case, it's just like a little, a research demonstration, mm. a prototype that allows us to then determine the footprint mm. of each asset of Morgan Stanley mm. across the planet in terms of its impacts, its dependencies on nature, and the risks to which it's exposed. Mm to help inform all of us as to what's going on. Mm. And then there's a question going back to Rico, mm. what do you do with that information? Mm. Mm. You know, what can the investor or the holder of the asset uh, do? What are the options? And so it's kind of working together mm. and just bringing the science mm. <clears throat> um, in in a very useful way. So being told by um, the asset managers what they need to know and try we then try to develop mm. answers that are mm. packaged up in a very useful way so that at a large scale and rapidly they mm. can get the information needed mm. uh, i have yeah. to yeah. add yeah. one thing so uh, in 2021 uh, if i remember correctly uh, Gro G funds, Global Financial Association mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Net Zero, uh, G funds was G -funds. established. And then uh, maybe several hundred financial institutions have committed to achieve carbon net zero mm -hmm. by 2050. So we have started to quantify 
our footprint mm. in GHG emission, and and then probably going forward, as I discussed at COP15, now we are talking about importance of biodiversity and mm. so on. So if we have some indicators or right. some milk mass mm. uh, to to book in our portfolio, then uh, then probably we are going to commit something mm. in the near future, mm. and then financial institutions are getting more serious mm. to, in, uh, to, to make research what kind of portfolio we invest mm. in, and then that will promote our financial deployment mm. uh, to those important initiatives. Mm. That's mm. for sure. Right, right. We are so furious mm. or <laughs> so, so serious, I would say, mm. to, to, to transform the business mm. to carbon neutrality right. in a proper manner, mm. and then uh, our nature uh, elements will be included, I'm sure. Right, right, yeah. I think the carbon um, decarbonization is a kind of great example for this uh, activity. So, but I think carbon uh, initiative is kind of amplified by uh, metrics quantifying the, 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 the effectiveness of the measure, uh, each action. But as you propose, Gretchen, as you propose GDP and GEP, do you think GEP could be quantified in the future, maybe in the near future? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Mm. So <laughs> we have developed the methodology further and further, and it is now actually being quantified and deployed across China um, as part of it's mandated now by mm. policy just since a couple of months um, at all levels. And some places are much farther ahead. Everything mm. is done very experimentally to see if it works before you know, mm. having everybody do it. So <clears throat> Shenzhen, the top four mm. cities are, are using this. Shenzhen is the furthest along and they track about 25 different mm. um, <clears throat> ecosystem benefits and um, they're yeah, reshaping the way decisions are made in terms of development across the city, valuation of properties and things like that mm -hmm. based on um, this approach. And now many other cities and countries really want to try this out. <clears throat> so since the United Nations Statistical Division um, certified this as part of its whole framework for valuing nature, um, we're working in Sweden, for example, across all municipalities to quantify mm. GEP. And there are a bunch of other countries. Colombia has started adopting it, mm. sometimes in a particular mm. sector, mm. especially where this is all new for the country mm. and mm. a lot of new systems need to be created for um, mm. really bringing this usefully in decisions. Mm. We're starting with water. The water sector is mm, 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 core mm, to, mm, mm. you know, the core engine for many dimensions mm. of economic activity. Right. And um, so Colombia is starting with that. Um, we also have Mongolia wants to take it up. There are mm. many um, countries in that UN Global Environment Facility project that want to take it up and we'll be looking for the most practical, mm. we're very practical mm. in approach right. and want to improve as we go and mm. just test things out and allow um, adaptation to mm. local circumstances and what's most important in Sweden versus mm. Mongolia will be quite different. Mm. Mm. Do you have any specific expectation for Japan, Kyoto and Tokyo, this they have tons of the uh, example case studies. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Japan has been a huge leader in this, and Good. especially uh, with the enough. Satoyama and Satoyama mm, yeah, right, right, initiatives. Right, right. Wow. Uh, yeah. I think that's what are, a lot of it comes mm. down to. Again, mm. why I was emphasizing stewardship. A uh, challenge in Japan is how the agricultural community, whether in coastal or mm. inland areas, has grown older like me and um, <laughs> <laughs> so there but there are in my recent trips to Japan I've met a lot of younger people mm. really inspired by this vision for a nature positive climate secure mm. future and all the transformation the social economic transformation that goes with it mm. so there there are many um, you know younger communities now advancing 
um, a whole new approach to, like um, I was in Chiba Prefecture mm -hmm. and I think the government has mandated, the last time I was there, they had recently mandated, it was just before the pandemic, um, organic rice be served to all school children. So it was really an incentive, you know, mm. and a very visible mm. one to mm. drive a shift in rice production mm. and an understanding among all households. You know, it gets to the broader right. cultural shifts that we need to make in our uh, way of looking at things. Mm. And it was connected to many investments in other aspects of biodiversity and the economic um, engine that biodiversity can be mm. for tourism mm -hmm. and cultural tourism, culture. activities and things mm -hmm. that right. from Tokyo everybody's right. dying to get mm -hmm. out and, mm -hmm. and experience. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. there's been tremendous leadership in Japan right. and I think there's enormous opportunity with um, both the protection that's been mm -hmm. achieved but also the real challenges mm -hmm. that lie ahead in the mega cities. Mm -hmm. How are all those kids and workers and everyone going to have nature experience. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There needs to be some creative thinking there to right. achieve right. A, a vision like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to ask this question to both of, it, both of you. Um, I downloaded the Invest software platform to my computer and try some, some of the data. And uh, so I think because I have some background for the programming and uh, ecological uh, ecosystem, but uh, I think it's kind of difficult to use sometimes for some people. And what do you expect for the future generation for the skills, let's say, okay. because your topic it includes public health or the every, or I think interdisciplinary research, right? And future generation needs some skills to adapt to that. And what kind of skills do you need for okay. you, let's say your lab member, or let's say, or Reiko, if you have, a, let's say, your freshman coming to your uh, department, what do you expect? In adapting the future change, the change or yeah. to promote sustainable finance, what kind Both. of aspect? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very interestingly, uh, I, I, I meet many new grads mm. to, for interviews to join our mm. company, and many questions are related to sustainable finance mm. because Bank of America has been very uh, proactive in that area, and then they ask us, uh, what can we do, uh, what can they do uh, in financial market mm. to, prom to contribute mm. to sustainable society. Mm. So young people are more curiosity or interest mm. in that area, but we are not charitable mm. organizations, obviously. So as a financial person, uh, of course, we need to continue growth if capitalism mm. still exists. Mm. Okay. Mm. So as a banking society uh, people, of course, we need to make growth some profit. Mm. But on the other hand, we also need to keep in mind that what we are doing and then is that good for the society mm. or is mm. it good mm. for nature or is it good for sustainable mm. society? Mm. And then, so we need to have the balanced mm. um, mind. And then also, uh, we can't be Yamamoto-san, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like a programmer no, no. or programming, uh, I don't know, whatever. So uh, from that regard, and, but, but, but on the other hand, there are so many advanced technology which can be usable for the elderly people like mm. myself, so we can't, we can't rely on our own skills, but our skills should be to accept the change mm. of technology, mm. or accept the change of the society, mm. adapt mm. to the so change of the society, mm. and then also imagine, imagine what we are doing mm. in this uh, neighborhood, mm. in this society, mm. in this country, mm. and then also on this growth. So, uh, growth. in a nutshell, I, I think we need, what young people need to mm. have imagination, imagination. empathy, okay. empathy, and then curiosity. Curiosity, thank you. I think <laughs> you've said it so beautifully. And, <laughs> um, I'll try to, I agree completely mm. and share mm. your vision and I, I'll just add a few things. 
One is um, that on the one hand, there will always be, like you're saying, a lot of technical mm -hmm. expertise required to manipulate some of the tools or take some approaches. Mm -hmm. We can lower the barriers um, to that, and that's mm -hmm. we're aiming to move invest from more of a research grade right. um, system mm -hmm. to something that will have a friendly user interface for mm -hmm. many different types of users. Um, and we're starting that in partnership with a team in Stockholm, actually, working in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. um, but I think more broadly, building on the nice points mm -hmm. you've just both made, it's um, a matter of cultivating a collective mindset and taking a more collectivistic rather than individualistic um, orientation to our lives and our purpose and um, their beautiful cultures that do have more of that collective <coughs> approach and we, need, we can cultivate that a lot more widely, mm. especially in young people. Mm. Um, and the empathy that goes mm. with that, the, mm. the type of understanding in a, um, of one another that I've seen, I have two teenagers and I'm amazed at how little education they get in the education system here mm. on really key topics mm. <laughs> to do with um, understanding why society looks the way it does mm. today. Uh, a lot of that history is not taught or is even actively being suppressed um, today. And um, at the same time, um, one other remark and building off again what you both have been saying is we need to be able to envision a lifetime of learning um, that we don't just master a few skills when we're in our 20s or something and then we're just going to hammer away with those particular tools and skills the rest of our lives. We've got to be really flexible and adaptable and, um, and have that curiosity and also an ability to continue mm. advancing our skills as we go along in partnership with others that bring other skills that we might never have. Mm working in teams that are less siloed by skills. Here, if you walk around the campus, it's very much divided by skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I work in the biology building and we're supposed to just focus <laughs> on biology there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we need to be interacting with people mm -hmm. in finance right. and social sciences of all sorts, in history and human, the many aspects of human development. And so mm -hmm. we are seeing more and more in the university education system, not in, in the system leading up to university, mm. unfortunately. But within universities, there are more programs where the extra curious students can mm. get together in an interdisciplinary way and focus more on issues that they care about and, um, mm. and learn skills. It doesn't mean not having deep skills, mm. but it means I mixing think. it up much more. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, John Doerr's sustainability uh, school, which launched last year? I think that, uh, recently. Yeah. I think it's a great example mm. of formalizing many efforts that have been underway mm. here and all over the world in trying to drive this shift, uh, recognizing mm. that um, there is a lot of curiosity mm. driven and also problem oriented research that needs to be advanced. And the only way really to um, advanced solutions mm. is in partnership mm. with people who would implement, <laughs> who mm. need, you know, who need to help make the solutions, mm. you know, activate them and, and such. So uh, I hope, so far the new school is extremely mm. new and it's hard to know exactly what it will mm. become, but I hope very much and I think it's likely that the focus will be on engagement mm with experts all over society, whether it's the gentleman in the Andes whose mm. farming mm. practices affect everybody's water security, mm. or um, someone living you know, in the heart of private finance. Mm. We, we need to be connected more and more and um, understand how to deploy all the resources mm. of a place, especially like this door school, 
for real impact mm -hmm. and not just, you know, university exercises. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you for great uh, uh, input. I'd like to uh, open the floor to the questions from audience. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, please raise your hand and uh, Mike will be following. Yes, please. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. My name is Hiro Otaki, and actually, this is from School of Medicine. I, was gra I graduated uh, inform clinical informatics management last year. And then my question is, you know, I, I don't know much about social tech, but I really understand your macro approach from Reiko and then you know, the project-based approach from the Professor Daly, is that pronunciation yeah. correct? Sure, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and then my, the moderator, Mr. Yasu, mm -hmm. Mr. Yasu told me, talk about the data things, but my question is here, it, it's uh, Stanford. So we want to know about the unmet needs, about data collection and then data analysis from macro, macro point of view mm -hmm. as well as a project-based point of view. I assume w which happens in medical field as well. Mm. You know, the project-based performance indicator, you know, the, the quality of data and then also subset of data varies from each project. And then how to you know, collect those, you know, different data and then integrate into the macro, you know, the measures. Mm. So that may be some, you know, the unmet mm. needs, huge unmet needs over there. So mm. could you explain mm. about a little bit more? Maybe already, you know, some startup exists to fill those gaps, but mm. if you have some example and then this is a, like a met needs, mm -hmm. you know, this is a place for mm -hmm. like a startup opportunity or mm -hmm. something like that things from your side, the project based side, and then also the macro side. Thank you. Okay, you've hit on, you know, a gold mine potentially. <laughs> it's also a, a huge <laughs> barrier right now, just as you say. Mm -hmm. So within the natural capital project, we have um, compiled global environmental data and we're bringing in ever more social, mm. economic, and health and other such data. But <clears throat> it's just as you say, the, that's pretty coarse scale. And it was only recently we could bring in the fine scale meter by meter data needed for cities. Mm. And um, <clears throat> every time someone compiles a new data layer, so to speak, that has a huge impact. An example that I'll give you that then emerged into a company is forest cover data. Going back to the beginning, mm -hmm. trees really are not only trees, all the, all the systems, the coral reefs, the grasslands, the grazing lands, the shrublands are important. But just to talk about trees, since we all can easily uh, relate to trees, um, before the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, there was a massive effort to get data on every tree across the world and then mainly focused in the tropics because there wasn't time and resources. But I know some of the teams that worked on that and um, it was a really inspiring project. It was tremendously successful. They got a huge amount of information and they advanced technology so that, for example, in the country of Peru, which they picked because it's so diverse, has some of the wettest in the heart of the Amazon, the headwaters of the Amazon, and some of the driest in the Atacama Desert along the coast ecosystems. They um, mapped every single tree for Peru, and they measured using this hyperspectral sensor mm. flown on an airplane that flew at very low elevation. It was quite dangerous. Um, mm. The team, thankfully, is all still mm. alive, wow. and one of them came and became my student after mm flying that plane for seven years. Wow. With the hyperspectral <laughs> sensor, they, they measured every aspect they could of the health and nutrition and um, hydration of the trees and how likely they were to live. Mm. There's a lot of drought going on in the Amazon and that kind of thing. Um, and that then, it, it really supported um, agreement around the climate accord that was a, a major step and it led to a small company called Salo.ai, S-A-L-O.ai, that you could look up. And this, it's, I think it's called the Forest Inventory, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that supported the state of California and PG&E. So it was the health of every tree in California and the ignition risk. After, you know, it's evident that a lot of the fires we're experiencing here are triggered by these accidental ignitions um, through, uh, you know, our energy system. Um, so that was extremely useful. And now um, it's just been bought up by Planet, that company, about a month ago. But there, I could give many other examples, but you're right on it. There's a lot happening in um, like wearables for health mm -hmm. metrics to touch on your medical um, context. And we're running even um, RCTs, randomized controlled trials with healthcare providers. Right. And it's again a, a, like a demonstration project, but to show we're looking at communities that have more and less aspect, um, access to nature. We're trying to quantify the return on investment on the part of a medical, um, you know, um, a health provider, the return on investment in promoting nature prescriptions and programs and other kinds of investment so that people have more access to nature. So there's a ton going on and basically every data layer needs improvement and, um, and there's scope I think for a lot of um, innovative startups. So uh, as financial industries, there are several ways uh, already to work with data providers. Uh, one of the way is to work together. So we work together with uh, academia, NGOs, or startups mm -hmm. to promote or to, to make some research and so on. And then also we are hiring experts uh, to our company to work together internally. And, and then also if we think that, oh, these startups make some fortune, then we invest in. So there are several ways for uh, private sectors to work with uh, these uh, new initiatives provided by academia or new, uh, new NGOs and so on. So we, we fully understand that we can't do anything alone and then we need knowledge, expertise, or uh, initiatives from the other sectors. And then collaboration is really important. And also we work together with uh, government as well. So across the sectors, across private sectors and public sectors, across the regions, uh, all the collaborations are really important to promote, uh, to analyze data and then utilize that data to, to make things happen. Thank you. Yeah, so I assume like, you know, in the corporate security, there's some accounting rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, accounting yeah, so rules account are also. Green, green yeah. accounting rules. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> already, already started. Yes. Yeah, ISSB will be launched. Mm. Will be launched this year. Mm. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, financial data or financial disclosures was internationalized. Uh, IFAS, you you may know, and then IFAS, uh, IFAS Foundation set up uh, ISSB. I don't know the abbreviation uh, details, but uh, uh, global uh, standard for. Uh, mm climate-related disclosure mm. has already started, and that will be mandatory going forward in the major countries, including Japan. So uh, accounting rules have already mm. uh, under uh, preparation, and that will change further. But what kind of elements to be on mm. accounting, it's still under discussion, and maybe new items will be added going mm. forward. Ideal if the corporate accounting comes into the project. Mm. So the, this is a water project needed. This kind of the yeah, yeah, it should be. It should be. The, the it should be yeah, agriculture project. Right. We have to have this major or something like that. Yeah, the details will be discussed further. But uh, like financial disclosure, uh, that, that's a national account point, right? So going. Yeah, yeah, I know, but uh, the data, uh, but, but in order to be narrative, we need some description or narrative, mm -hmm. but uh, ISSB has just started, just and then that will be discussed further, working together with maybe Professor Daly, but uh, that has mm -hmm. just started. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Yeah, that could be read, that could read to uh, GEA. -E 
GDP. GDP. Yeah, that's great. We have two minutes to rest, but maybe one last quick question from audience. If not, oh yes, please. Thank you. I'll try and keep this short. Michael Beeman with APARC. Um, my sense is that in order to reach the, the qualifi qualifying um, mm. criteria for green bonds, it requires a substantial carbon mm. shift in a project of some sort. Japan, of course, is um, wonderfully famous for um, maybe a slower, in a sense, a slower shift so far, mm. but rather kind of squeezing out energy efficiency mm. in every possible way, mm. be it dark hallways, be it you know appliances, mm. be it et cetera. Mm. So I guess my question is how, what is the interplay between energy efficiency mm. as a goal of what the kinds of projects you're trying to finance? Can, can those even have a chance to qualify for green bonds in a general sense? Or, and if not, um, is, this, is there a place for Japan's contribution to find kind of a new way of measuring and, and marketing bonds that do support more focus on energy efficiency as opposed to energy transition? Uh, both. Uh, so if you look at the recent report by the government, they are going to focus, first of all, renewable energy. But uh, Japan has been leading uh, energy efficiency as well, so they promote energy efficiency as well. But in order to achieve carbon net zero by 2050, we have to do everything because we are so heavily relying on fossil mm -hmm. fuel. And in order to be decarbonized, not only uh, energy efficiency, but all measures, maybe including uh, nuclear power should be also promoted going forward. So all that measures should be taken. Mm. I don't know how it goes, <laughs> but that, that is the official, official announcement, announcement by the government. Mm. All right, thank you very much for a great session. Okay. Uh, please give the, uh, give the work a warm hand. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Minute zwei.
Right, if everyone can get back to their seats. All right, so now let's get us started with the second panel entitled STEAM Expo and the Future of Sciences and Arts Education. Uh, on this panel, we are fortunate to have Professor Takako Hikotani as the moderator. Um, Takako, right now, is a professor at Gakshuin University International Center, and is also a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute in Tokyo. Uh, and right now, this winter term, she is a visiting professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. So we are fortunate that she's in the neighborhood. Um, when I first met her, she was, a, she was associate professor at the National Defense Academy of Japan. And then from 2016 to 2021, she was a Gerald L. Curtis associate professor of modern Japanese politics and foreign policy at Columbia University. Many of you may have met her in that capacity. Um, so she has a wealth of experience in educating young minds and uh, continues to do so now in Tokyo. So she's a, a great moderator for this session. So Takako, please take it away. Thank you, Kir, for the kind introduction. Um, hi, welcome to the second session on STEAM Expo and the future of science and arts education. Uh, you might be wondering, how do all those things come together? But we have two excellent speakers. We're very lucky to welcome two pathbreakers in the field who somehow bring those four together. So it's okay if you actually don't really know what STEAM is. It's okay if you don't know what expo they're talking, we're going to be talking about because we're going to find out. And I think it's a really important session for this meeting. Um, as Kai Kyo said, it's they're working on very innovative ways to equip um, the new generation with the skills and mindset, I think more impor importantly, to become innovators who are mindful of the social impact they might have. And secondly, to broaden their horizons to make a difference, not just global, uh, locally, but also globally. And I think continuing on from the last session, uh, Reiko-san mentioned the importance of imagination, empathy, and curiosity. And I think that's what they're focused on, and that's actually something that's very difficult to accomplish sometimes in a university setting. So I'm very curious to know what they have to share with us. And on this note, I'd like to introduce them. Um, it is actually in your handout as well, but let me just emphasize what I think is fascinating about what you, both of you do. Um, Sachiko Nakajima um, is a musician, mathematics, researcher and a STEAM educator. How can you be a mathematician and a, and a musician at the same time? I don't know, but we're, gonna, we're about to find out how she accomplished all that. She's also a CEO of STEAM.inc. That's the right way to pronounce it. Um, and the representative director of STEAM um, Band Association and a thematic project pr produced for Expo 2025. And where is Expo 2025 taking place? <laughs> it's going to take place in Osaka, Japan, and we're going to find out more about it. And so, um, and she's also um, serves as a STEM Girls Ambassador Cabinet Office, um, and she's a project researcher at Graduate School of Math Mathematical Sciences at the University of Tokyo, and she has won the gold medal as the first Japanese woman in the International Mathematics Olympics while she was a math, uh, musician as well. That's just amazing. And she passionately conducts research on, on technology, on art, technology, as well as music, math, math, mathematics, and education. So that's mm -hmm. Sachiko-san, and we're very lucky to have you here all the way from Japan on a very short visit, okay. I understood. Um, and so um, next, we're very, I'm very happy to introduce Rie-san, who mm -hmm. is a really, also a really good friend of mine who's an assistant professor and director of initiative for education and policy, education policy innovation at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Uh, Ria's research addresses topics such as international assessments, education reforms, gender and STEAM learning. 
Um, she was previously a lecturer and interim director of the International Comparative Education, International Education Policy Analysis Programs at the Stanford Graduate School of Education and received her PhD and MA from Stanford University and her BA from International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. So many of you, I'm sure, know Surya from the, your time at Stanford. Uh, at this point, I have to plug in something that's irrelevant to this panel that I'm a pr proud Stanford grad. And yes. I'm actually very happy <laughs> and su surprised to know that you're having your 40th anniversary, which means that when I was here, Air Park, Air, A Park was less than 10 years old. So I'm a bit oh, shocked okay. by that. But anyway, um, and so um, Yue san, um, she's previously worked at aid agencies such as the World Bank and Japan International Cooperation Agency. Mm -hmm. So her background in education is actually very diverse. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in the US or in Japan. And she helped advance equity folks education pro projects in Morocco, Tunisia, Vietnam, and Laos. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, she co-founded an education nonprofit organization, Sky Level, to promote STEAM learning and design thinking to girls living in Japan. So these are our two speakers today. We're very lucky to get to hear from them about how they got there mm -hmm. to where, what they're doing and also what they're doing right now. So first, I'd like to turn to Sachiko-san for your presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Sachiko Nakajima. I'm very honored and thrilled to be here in front of these distinguished people, uh, including online participants as well. So I would like to talk a little bit, maybe for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, about kind of STEAM activities I'm now doing and also World Expo kind of things, yes. So as Takako-san already introduced me a lot, but I would like to introduce myself a little bit more. So I have many faces, like first uh, music, so jazz pianist, composer, um, but I actually stopped music during my junior and high school days. And instead, I got observed in mathematics. So I won the gold medal at the International Mathematical Olympiad at Indi India and silver at Argentina. And I majored in mathematics but uh, at Tokyo University. But again, I restarted re music at the university. And after graduation, I started my uh, professional musical music career. And the third, oh, maybe I can show you a little bit about my works, um, like books or CDs. So but in my 30s, I found that music and mathematics are very similar to each other and close, yeah, closely related with each other. And also, I got observed in education, in the beauty of education uh, from my university days. First, I developed some programs of modern mathematics like topology or number theory or those kind of things uh, in my university days um, and in more in interactive, intuitive, experiential ways. So that was really, really fun for me. And I've been, I've been doing that for 15 years, but uh, gradually I, I actually met with the concept STEAM and I, from maybe around 2014, I started to use the word STEAM. And in 2017, I launched the STEAMing with A capital. Yes, and I've been promoting STEAM uh, in not only in Japan, but in the world, actually. So I've been really passionate to deliver the joy of creation through STEAM all over the world. So my aim, somehow, is to democratize creativity. So we believe that everyone has a creativity inside, and each creativity is different and diverse. But sometimes uh, society uh, cannot release those kind of creativities in each person, from each person. So uh, what we are doing is to, like, to release and invoke creativity from anybody beyond uh, any boundaries like uh, economical gap or gender gap or sometimes with uh, disabilities or something like that. And, but I have another face. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, I went to, uh, as a full writer, I went to NYU ITP. ITP uh, stands for Interactive Telecommunications Program. So it's an art and technology program. So I 
first I learned, of course, coding, but also AI, AR, VR, something like that, and use that as a media to express yourself or do some kind of, mm, not just artistic, but also social uh, concepts. Yes, so we did uh, various projects with diversified people from all over the world, and that was really, really fun. So I, of course, I started my steaming before coming here, so I actually went back and forth from New York and Japan and did many STEAM activities, but also I myself learned STEAM. And in 2020, I went back to Japan and uh, the go government uh, appointed me to be one of the thematic project producer at World Expo. Uh, maybe you, you didn't know ex where Expo will be held, but it, it's uh, so Expo 2025, Osaka, Kansai, Japan uh, would be held in Osaka. And it's, it's will be held in uh, Yumeshima. Yumeshima is a reclaimed land. Um, so it's a not so big island, but it's, uh, it's an island. So at Yumeshima, uh, from April to October, we will have a kind of big festival, uh, Expo 2025. And the eight thematic project producers are uh, appointed, and I'm one of them. Uh, I would like to introduce this later. So, uh, before going into STEAM, my STEAM activity introduction, I would like to ask you, what is STEAM? So, the definition of STEAM could be diverse, maybe, but uh, sometimes I say like uh, it's a project-based or inquiry-based, curiosity-based, playful, inter- or multidisciplinary learning journey over science, technology, engineering, art or arts and mathematics. It's more like a, not just a learning science or mathematics, lear, not just learning the correct, correct knowledge of science or uh, mathematics, but it's more like a learning like a mathematicians or scientists or researchers or you know, make something like an artist or engineer, I think, or like an entrepreneur or inventors. So I really love this quote by John Maeda, uh, he tweeted uh, this in 29. He says that design is a solution to a problem and art is a question to a problem. So I think both are very, very important. So of course, if you come up with an idea, you have to shape your solutions. That's a lot design or engineering part. But also in this VUCA world, uh, I think everybody should invent your own question, like researchers or artists. Anybody, I think, so even children or elderly people or anybody, I think, uh, should kind of have your own question. And it could be changed every day, but it, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, I think it's a very important part. But before that also, I think playing a lot, asobi in Japanese, uh, is very, very important to get used to a new media or to the life itself. Like sometimes playing in the nature is also very important to create something new, come up with a new idea. So in Japan, now STEAM education is being promoted by Ministry of Education, but also by Ministry of Economy. So, um, so next, Ministry of Education defines STEAM as an interdisciplinary approach to learning where people apply each academic subject to discover and solve the real life problems. So that's the definition by MEXT. Um, also, as you may know, I didn't put those kind of information here, but um, now kind of radical revolution is being done uh, in Japan in, it, in the educational field. So for example, uh, like GIGAS, GIGA school uh, renovation uh, project is done. And uh, so each person has some laptop or tablet finally, uh, for, uh, yeah, in junior high school and elementary school. And also uh, mixed says that you should have an active dialogue based deep learning and also the learning should be open to the society or something like that. And inquiry-based learning with no unique answer uh, are also very encouraged uh, at schools. But sometimes it's difficult for teachers 
to do those kind of new terms, new type of methodologies at the school. So teachers could be a little bit stressed, but I think that's why we should show more kind of cases and also show more philosophy, but also a con concrete ideas or cases, actual cases as well. And the uh, uh, right one is, uh, is introduced by Ministry of uh, Economy, uh, which is uh, Learning Innovation Committee. Uh, in Japanese, we say Miraktu, future classroom. So I, I was also in the committee um, so I've been working a lot with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Economy. But, um, so Ministry of Economy announced this kind of model. So they defined uh, together, or together, they defined STEMized learning is to have waku waku playfulness in the center first, but also you should have the circulation of knowing and creating. So knowing is still important nowadays, but you should create something after knowing rap very, uh, not rapidly, but yeah, you should have the circ circulation of knowing and creating. And after that, maybe during your creation, you would like to know more about the things and you should think more. So those kind of a circulation with a center, uh, with waku waku in the center is very important. And that's what Meti said. So our aim is to democratize creativity, playful steam. So from here, I would like to rapidly show some of my activities. So these are the artworks by uh, high school students uh, with p5.js, which uh, the coding language, which was developed for artists and designers. So children, for the first time, I did that coding, but they Come up with many, came up with many various diversified ideas and tried to, yeah, shape that uh, with a very playful, playfulness. But uh, gradually they come up with more social ideas, but more deeper ideas later. And these are the activities uh, at Sudi Joshi. Sudi Joshi is like math girls. Uh, there is a website called Suri Joshi. So please, if you can visit Suri Joshi website, uh, yeah, please, uh, because uh, many female or yeah mathematicians uh, tried to convey the joy and beauty of mathematics on this website. Of course, anybody can access to it, but yeah, mathematics has many places, and we believe mathematicians believe that mathematics doesn't have only one unique solution. It has more diversified ideas. So if you change the setting a little bit, you can see the things dif in a different angles. So our, we, when we do the workshop of Suri Joshi, we set the theme like to discover math or create with math. And under the concept, you are all mathematicians. We sometimes do this kind of workshop for girls and mothers or those who think they are females. But also, uh, of course, we do the workshop at any way, uh, all over the world as well. And sometimes we do, uh, we integrate STEAM with sports, like basketball or tag rugby, soccer, baseball. But for example, like this, um, with a mathematical model or data, we sometimes see the sports from different angles. But after that, you do the sports and find that, oh, it's not kind of, kind of different from what we thought on the board. But still, you can see the things from various ways. And that's, that helps you to understand what sports is or sometimes what model is as well. And And as I said, it, those kind of students' activities gradually go into more social problems or artistic problems, like music or agriculture or traffic jam, or it's kind of where this slides, but like uh, in agriculture school or in fisheries high school or welfare kind of schools, uh, children come up, yeah invents many 
interesting daily life issues. And they try to use the uh, idea of robots or sensors to shape the solutions. So those kind of prototyping and ideas are really, really interesting. So we do these kind of programs or projects uh, through sometimes online or in the real life setting. And we are now also collecting creativities by children of, uh, we define children as zero to 120 years old. So I think everyone here is a child. Is a child. So, but I believe that everyone has good creativity. So, but sometimes it's easier to come up with the idea from after getting some hints by other people. So we would like to collect more creativities of all over the world of what, zero to 120 years old. Yeah. So for example, the left one was done by Tamagawa, uh, Tamagawa Gakuen uh, Handwell Choir Club. They hoped to let the deaf friends to in, uh, enjoy the beauty of Handwell Choir. So that's why they started to learn coding. Of course, they, they did a lot of practice with uh, Handbell Choir, but also they tried to learn more about coding in order to uh, show the beauty of Handbell Choir. And the deaf school children as well, they, okay, so they thought that not just receiving the, those kind of things, but they also tried to uh, learn coding. And they coded how to vibrate or how to uh, show the color uh, based on the sounds. Yes, so both of them learned something. Coding is not just, uh, not the only important thing, but still, uh, as a media, they learned coding to uh, enjoy the handbag choir all together, even if they cannot hear. Yes, those kind of projects are being created and done by students. Yeah. So, uh, and we, four days ago, we did a first uh, contest called Learning Harmony Contest. And there are two characteristics here. One is that we matched professional mentors to students. So students first, before submitting the works, they could choose the mentors on their own interest. They could choose four mentors to talk uh, for 15 minutes. So even if they don't, know what to do, uh, sometimes they could choose a mentor uh, based on their interests. So that's uh, one challenge. And uh, another characteristic is to have uh, the target uh, in a very diversified setting, like from 0 to 18. And also, we had a senior section from 40, uh, you know, 65 years old. So it was really fun. Maybe we would publish this kind of video later, so please check it. Um, I have a lot. I would like to talk. Maybe I should. OK, maybe I should finish uh, um, later. <laughs> but we need mentors as well. And also Cambodian people are now uh, enjoying those kind of activities. Um, also trying to mentor Japanese people as well. And we also uh, value nature. So we sometimes do nature-based STEAM. So we really value experiential things. And yeah, so sometimes combined with AI or something. And we do more art things. Also, we, with Kyoto, Urasenke people, uh, we do the project to create the chashitsu, uh, tea room. So children would experience the very uh, authentic tea, tea way before making the tea room. But it's, it's really an interesting, inspiring project. Um, and I, I can learn also the very authentic, what, what is the core of a tea way or a tea room. And we do a lot more, like uh, innovating libraries and muse uh, museums. So this year, we did uh, a library STEAM playground project with the Ministry of Economy. Um, so we set some kind of 3D printer or robot sensors 
as well as cardboard or something like that, and we did some events. But also, they, yeah, gradually it could be the daily life event. Uh, maybe as um, I mean, the United States already have this kind of setting in the library, but in Japan it's not so popular. So I would like to make, uh, yeah, in, uh, increase these kind of activities in the libraries. And we do sometimes uh, camp, STEAM playground camp. And also, a Ministry of Economy start, launched STEAM library. It can be also searched. I think you can search STEAM library. I actually proposed to Ministry of Economy to launch this kind type of things because uh, we use the taxis to uh, do the, some kind of projects. So I think it should be open to everybody. So that's why in the second year and third year, uh, we, yeah, many companies started to develop some STEAM program. Uh, we are not sure which is good or not, but you can freely uh, access to it and check it and customize it or use it uh, as your own, on your own interest. And we have also eight programs there, so you can yeah, access to the STEAM library and enjoy it. And I was also inspired by many professors at university, uh, New York University and open innovation is being done. And I, I would skip this kind of, uh, my media art projects like slime music, musical instruments or AR doo music playground. But I, I myself am kind of uh, enjoying these kind of things. And I would like to talk a little bit more about World Expo. So, sorry, maybe I'm, yeah, getting long, so maybe very quick introduction about Expo 2025. So, uh, so that's a Miyak Miyak, Miyak kun Maybe, do, do you know Miyak Miyak? Maybe, ah, some, some of you know. Maybe, in, yeah. So this is kind of weird logo, and Miyak Miyak are now kind of getting popular uh, in in the world. But, um, and we have the very important theme: designing future society for our lives. So. Under that theme, we have eight thematic project producers, and I'm the one. And I have the theme, invigorating lives with learn, play, arts, and sports. And we will have um, a one pavilion. So we will have eight pavilions, actually. So I, I and our team will have one pavilion called the Life, uh, Life Playground Jellyfish Pavilion. So maybe you can see. Designing future society for our lives. Plans are underway for the Expo's eight signature pavilions, which will reflect on and renew the concept of life. I think Expo is a festival for people and a chance for all of us to create a co-creative, inclusive, playful ecosystem of the world over various gaps. My theme is invigorating lives about play, learn, art, and sports. And our signature pavilion is called Life Playground Jellyfish Pavilion. Here, we are now trying to open a part of this and get connected with as many pavilions, your pavilion, or places in the world. And the journey has already begun. Let's start our various miracle collaborations from now. Yeah, so... Um, so in 2025, we will have somehow a jellyfish pavilion. Uh, I don't say why we chose the word jellyfish, but uh, yeah, jellyfish pavilion would be there. But be even before that, uh, we are now doing many kinds of projects like future earth school projects, inclusive klage or garbage festival like that, and to democratize creativity. So future earth, uh, in the future earth school projects, we connect many schools, including uh, special needs education school or universities, or museums, or libraries, or all over the world. And with Tetsuo Kobori, great architect, uh, which, whom I love, uh, yes, we, ha we will have a jellyfish pavilion. But also we will have uh, some uh, events as well, and uh, we still need some sponsorship, <laughs> so yeah. And also many teammates, more teammates, so from today, I really like, 
you to kind of join in this project and start something together. So we, uh, of course, math and music are kind of the center, but also we have many axes axis uh, in the core, like a re learning revolution for one, uh, 0 to 120 years old children toward inclusive, playful society. We are working with those who have kind of serious disabilities sometimes, or uh, LGBTQ, or yeah, many diversified people. And also we are very, very interested in traditional tribal music or matsuri. Uh, I didn't insert any Matsuri picture here, but we are now visiting many traditional places and enjoy those kind of, yeah, Matsuri. Um, also, we would like to show more about Japanese or global culture, authentic culture like tea way uh, with uh, uh, creative ways. And also, again, circular economy, of course, and the garbage. We will have a garbage festival in coming April. And also, I would like to globalize Japan in this and uh, yeah, making this chance, uh, making this, yeah, the use of this chance. So we would like to have the Expo host town system. So connecting region, regional places and countries. Yes, so yeah, those kind of ideas are being done. And sometimes we do the event with diversified people and um, like inclusive kurage or, and many children are drawing kurage, uh, kurage is a jellyfish. So, so uh, I'm very, very excited to talk more with uh, san Takako-san from now on. And also from, with you maybe later, uh, let's realize a co-creative world, playful world uh, through the creative learning all together and making the playful use of STEAM and the World Expo. Please contact me uh, if you have any questions or ideas. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to ask Yesan san to present. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing presentation. And I'm just really grateful to be here today. I am in the presence of many people that I admire. And one of them is Takako Sensei, who has done a lot of work on US-Japan relations. I've been learning so much from you. And also for the invitation from um, Kiyo Sensei about uh, this uh, symposium. And I have drawn a lot of really interesting, wonderful insights from his work as well. And so thank you so much, Sachiko-san, for your presentation. So I will begin. Hello, my name is Rie Kijima, and I am a co-founder of an organization called Skylabo, which is an education um, organization that helps empower the next generation of STEAM learners. I'm also an assistant professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. This is where I currently live. Uni University of Toronto is a public research institute that is located in the heart of a very diverse city um, in Toronto, in Canada. Before moving to Toronto, I was a master's student here at Stanford University, then a doctoral student, then became a lecturer and an interim director um, of, at the School of Education, which is just around the corner from where we are today. So it's really wonderful to be back on campus. Um, and I've stayed here for more than a decade, uh, teaching and studying and really developing my life here. Now, before coming to Stanford, I worked in Tunisia, um, a country in the Maghreb re region, so in the northern African country, and I worked on projects related to education, like improving the quality of higher education. After being in Tunisia, I moved to Vietnam and worked in the country office there. Um, and I focused on education projects related to girls, ethnic minority students, and teachers to help improve equity issues in those uh, countries, especially in uh, Vietnam and Laos. 
Being and living in Vietnam is probably one of the highlights of my career. Now, growing up, I attended a very different kind of education, right? I received a very different kind of education. At this international school that I attended as an elementary school student, um, I was surrounded by so many students from different backgrounds. Right? It provided an alternative kind of education for children from all different backgrounds. It was very racially, ethnically very diverse, and there were many languages spoken at this school. And as you can see from this photo, which is a black and white photo, so it tells you how, how um, old this school is, and it's actually shut down very recently. Um, but there were also students from the US Navy. Um, so you had some US, uh, military kids and their families also part of this particular school. So growing up with children with different nationalities and background really shaped the way that I think about myself. Um, being in a very diverse learning environment in a very homogeneous society like Japan, and this is 40 years ago, right, made me quite aware of my own identity. And years later, I began to understand more and more how education shaped the way that I understood the issues and the world around me. So today, I'd like to talk about education and the role of STEAM learning. But before we begin, I'd like to contextualize a little bit about the role of education and why we think it's really important in society. So there are different rationales for why we should invest in education. The very first one is economic. We should invest or to pr produce, right, to invest in education because it contributes to human capital development, which then, hopefully, it improves economic growth for that particular country. There are many debates about the actual linkages of education to economic development, but in general, there's an idea that when you invest in education, human capital increases, which leads to greater economic growth. Another purpose of education is social development. In order to maintain and advance the welfare of society, Right? Education serves a very important role. Children learn to read and write, become functional members of society, and contribute to social development. And education creates that social norm. Oh, sorry. Human as the f another reason why we want to think about the role of education is human right. The right to education was declared as Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and this meant that countries were required to provide education for all children. Right? This is important because that increased the students going into schooling. However, we all know that not every child goes to school, and also that not every child receives the same quality of education. Now, development psychologists like Lev Vygotsky and John Piaget, who are constructivists, have argued that education is to elevate human potential. Learning is a way to achieve their given talents and characteristics. Children construct their knowledge through interactions with others. They make meaning of the world around them through trial and error in various learning contexts. So according to Bell Hooks, a feminist philosopher, sociologist, and an education. Education is a form of individual liberation. It is an act to achieve one's greatest freedom, freedom of thought, freedom to choose, and freedom to engage. Education is a form of authentic engagement with knowledge that spurs greater consciousness in learners. So perhaps, one goal that we must strive for is to create an environment in which young learners can believe that they can change the world for the better, that they can be catalysts of change. In 2016, this is almost seven years ago, Dr. Mariko Yang Yoshihara, who's in the audience today, and I started this nonprofit organization called Sky Level to empower the next generation of STEAM thinkers. Mariko and I 
met here right on Stanford campus many years ago, and we have collaborative, uh, collaborated extensively every day to promote the idea of STEAM education. With the support of Professor Emerita and former Associate Dean of the School of Education, Shelley Goldman, we created a STEAM design thinking curriculum for middle and high school students living in Japan. Our team also consists of another important member who's also in the audience, Disako Ninamiya, who is the interim executive director of Skylabo. So we work together to advance this work, not just, just doing research, but also to be in Japan and empowering these students. Our, design, we, our team designs, adapts curriculum to local contexts and implements human-centered learning programs to middle and high school students living in Japan. Then what we do is we just don't do the program itself. We actually collect data, we analyze them, and we write papers for research purposes. Now what we do is to integrate elements of STEM education and liberal arts, which we call it STEAM. Our approach leans perhaps a little bit more heavily on the E of the STEM, which is the engineering component, because there's a lot of prototyping that happens. But we emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary approach to tackling so-called wicked problems or very complex issues that are very difficult to solve, like how to cl tackle climate change. How do you address gender gap? How do you embrace diversity and inclusion in a society? These are big themes. Over the course of seven years, we have come to realize that our STEAM approach is not just simply combining coding and graphic arts or robotics with design. Our definition of STEAM is embracing the human-centered approach to tackling solutions in a more meaningful, playful, artful, soulful, needs-based solution that aims to cultivate a sense of purpose and meaning in young learners' minds. So here's a quote by Steve Jobs. Technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts that yields the results that make our hearts sing. His words reflect the very essence or the concept of STEAM that we embrace. Now, I would like to highlight some examples of STEAM learning that occurs in our program. We provide experiential learning that involves the users or someone that the team interviews, right, to understand their needs. In doing so, the participants develop a strong sense of empathy, concern for others, for the user. In this photo, a group of students are interviewing an engineer who came to speak about her experiences as a woman working for a multinational company in the electronics industry. Another example is the process that students go through to discuss, negotiate, collaborate, uh, collaborate in producing an artifact or a prototype that meets the needs of the user. So in another word, students navigate a very intensive and hands-on collaborative learning experiences to reach their collective goal, not their individual goal, but their collective goal of creating a prototype for their user. The third example is the interaction the learners have with their near peer mentors. We call them design coaches. Right? These design coaches are typically undergraduate or graduate students who are slightly older than the middle school or the high school students who participate in our program. Each team is assigned to either one or two design coaches who provide facilitation in terms of knowledge content, and they also serve as someone who can translate from Japanese to English because our program is conducted in both languages. Now, over the course of seven years, we have come to realize that our vision for education really boils down to three things. Okay? The very first one is 
our increasingly challenging, complex world, we need learners who have the courage, the audacity, motivation, self-belief that they can be a catalyst of social change. The second thing that we have learned from the last seven years is that we believe that empathy can be cultivated and supported in learning, providing learners with an opportunity to reflect, understand, and become empathetic listeners. You might not necessarily agree 100% with the person who's sitting next to you all the time, and that's impossible because we all have different views. But we can provide an opportunity for these students and these learners to be at least empathetic towards each other. Third, we need to embrace heterogeneity of thinking among learners. It is the fundamental belief that each person brings to the table something unique and different. The diversity enhances idea generation and enables learners to better understand the world around them. Now, so how do we do that? We talk about these three different mindsets that we call the sky level mindset, but also the innovators mindset. The very first one is to encourage students and learners to think out of the box, that it's okay to try something different. It's okay that you're trying to bring out an idea that no one else is thinking about. Right? And the second thing that we emphasize quite a bit is to have bias towards action. If you have an idea, make it into something that's actionable. Oftentimes, we have these really great ideas and it just sits in our minds and we forget about them or it just kind of goes away without really developing. Just give it a try. Make it into something that's tangible so that other people can understand and take part in that idea. The third mindset that we often talk about, which I, we believe this is a really important concept, especially in our education system today, that there's so much emphasis on success, that we need to fail in order to succeed. Every time we fail, we fail forward. So that's another message that we try to, um, uh, to mention in our program. Um, Sorry, I think I might have skipped this slide. But I'm going to go to the, to the slide on the impact. Through our research that we have conducted on collecting data from the students, we can say that there are four different things that we have identified to be very impactful in the way that we operate and we provide these educational opportunities. The very first one is that when students participate in our program, they, their interest in STEM increases. So prior to participating in our workshop, perhaps they didn't know too much about STEM, but they actually do have a lot more insights about what STEM is. The second is the students who participate in our study demonstrate greater pro-social tendencies, such as wanting to do good for the world or to have the desire to help other people. The third thing that we have found out that the participants have a, sense, a, a heightened sense of creative self-efficacy. Now this is the ability, the, the belief that you have about yourself in being creative, but also to understand that those creativity can be harnessed over time. The fourth thing that we learned is that through these experiences, that students elevate their critical consciousness. They lead to greater awareness of the issues around them. And that also is linked to elevating their global consciousness. As a scholar of education, I often think about the role that education play in the lives of children, youths, mature learners, learners of all ages around the world. I'd like to end this presentation by sharing a quote from Roseberry, Ogonowski, DeShizuno, and Warren's article, which talks about the importance of heterogeneity. As educators, we can do more to create an environment that fosters engaged learning that is grounded in intense curiosity and emergent insight. 
I'd like to close by sharing photos of our team. And without them, this is not possible. And we would love to obtain your insights and support as we move forward in expanding our work. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure all of you must have some questions that you might want to ask, but I'd like to take the privilege of being the moderator mm -hmm. to start the discussion and that um, to open for discussion um, questions later. Um, first, um, Sachiko san, I was really struck by um, how play and the uh, waku wakuness, I think waku waku is a really good Japanese term, but it's excitement and fun, and that's really at the center of what you're trying to do and how you try to inspire people. And especially, you talked about how play leads to um, um, in inventing your question and shaping the solution, the two steps. And that I always want my, my students in a classroom to ask questions, and I'm frustrated when I don't get any questions, but I realize that maybe mm -hmm. there's something missing that I should have been aware that there had to be a more play aspect or something that they will be waku waku about mm -hmm. that will engage um, to make them want to ask questions. So my, um, my question to you is where do you come up with these ideas? Because I think the key that you say is that I think the chashitsu example uh -huh. is a way for people to not take things for granted and to think about why a chashitsu is the way it is rather than to tell people that chashitsu is this way and it has to be this way, mm -hmm. that you don't take for things for granted. And I think what you do tends to be hands-on. Mm -hmm. That you, like people who are good at sports can experience through sports and somebody who's not sports can experience through math. And I'm not good at either math or sports. I don't know what to do. But anyway, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just that different ways to be involved. So, so my question is where do the inspirations come from? Mm -hmm. Does it come from feedback, working on different things and reaching out? And especially, how do you reach out to the next generation, young kids, mm -hmm. who you might not think is naturally that curious? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's easy to find students who, cur who are curious to get to mm -hmm. you, but I think you're, what you're drawing is to try to widen Mm -hmm. the group of people who are more curious. And I think that's a really difficult thing to do. So where does your inspiration come from and what were the challenges that you had in the past? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is a very interesting question. And so um, I think we need to have some kind of safety zone in our mm -hmm. mindset. So mm -hmm. if you think that it's, I'm not good at it or I'm not confident in it, mm -hmm. and sometimes they, easily think that even adults can easily think that uh, we are told to do so mm -hmm. or something like that. So I think mm -hmm. interest driven could be very important mm -hmm. uh, to let them actively engage in something. Mm -hmm. But usually in Japan, uh, people often, especially girls mm -hmm. that around me, say that uh, they are not confident in having the wakwaku, so having the curiosity mm -hmm. or having some mm -hmm. kind of Ski mm. likes something. So if you compare with somebody else, uh, sometimes they feel that oh, I'm, I, I don't like things that, uh, more than her or him or something like that. Mm. But, um, but I, I think he, so I think we have to say that it's, it, you don't have to compare. <laughs> it's a very uh, yeah, easy word, but um, yeah. First, uh, you, uh, we have to say that. And also, as for the question, uh, and of course, curiosity, I, I think it's kind of uh, not it. Uh, mm. So if you get used to being asked some question or being asked to have some question, mm -hmm. you can get used to having those kind of questions. In, I think in the United States, maybe it's better Mm -hmm. uh, for children, because they are uh, familiar with those kind mm -hmm. of circumstances. In Japan, I, I don't think it's popular mm -hmm. to be asked something so if, uh, during their childhood days. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, first, even if we cannot get any good 
questions from mm -hmm. children or even adults, mm -hmm. I don't think we should think that, oh, it's mm. really, uh, you, you, mm, you, sh you shouldn't lose confidence or, because uh, maybe they are just shy or mm -hmm. they have some sense, but they cannot express that mm -hmm. uh, in a real world. So I think it, we need to ask them again and again and uh, get the sense, kind of the essence from mm -hmm. that, even if uh, the answer from them could sound ridiculous, sometimes they have some essential part in mm -hmm. them. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I think mm -hmm. uh, is important to have it, yeah, mm -hmm. the right question. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, give them a sense of empowerment mm -hmm. by giving them positive feedback and yeah. create different avenues where people with different skill sets or different strength can express their curiosity. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, mm. On that, um, Ria-san, I'm, mm. I'm curious to know, especially what, how your work, I think, mm. has especially focused on uh, girls or women mm -hmm. in Japan. And Sachiko-san, you mentioned the Suri Joshi project uh, because of the sense that maybe there is something about the education system mm -hmm. in Japan that does not empower women in a way that should be the case. So, what are the things that you have done? Um, and is one of the things that you think might be an opportunity to have all, all girls environment, or do you think it's better to have both? Because one of the challenges mm. of these things is that maybe you want to have all the women come and have them, like maybe they need a safe place. Mm. But on the other hand, you're kind of doing it at the expense of diversity sometimes. And um, so what's the right balance about like, empowering women but doing it in an environment where it's not just them, mm -hmm. and like through your projects, I know that's really one of the focus. Mm -hmm. And what has been your experience so far? These are great questions. Um, what the studies tell us mm -hmm. is that when women have, and girls, especially middle school, high school girls, mm -hmm. who are the ones who fall out of that pipeline fairly mm -hmm. early in mm -hmm. their life, Imagine these 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14 year olds are saying, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. And it seems a little too early to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Now the literature suggests that when you have support and provide opportunities, then they will take it and they will experience it. And then that creates that opportunity to go back. And perhaps we have to create that revolving door for them mm -hmm. so that they go in and out, in and out. And then at one point, you choose to go into STEM or not. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that revolving door for us is to provide that support. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of literature also that suggests that when women and girls have mentors, mm -hmm. then it, perhaps that support group can mm -hmm. also make a difference. Mm -hmm. So we're not advocating that all girls should be separated mm -hmm. from boys or all genders, mm -hmm. right? I think right now we have to also move away from the um, gender binary mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. all genders should have a space mm -hmm. in that inclusive learning environment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that, we can find ways through studies that there are ways that perhaps those individuals can feel that support. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we have embedded in the mm -hmm. design of our program mm -hmm. by creating near peer mentors. These are undergraduate, graduate students mm -hmm. who are just slightly a little senpai mm -hmm. of these students, mm -hmm. right? So they have some really great communication and collaboration mm -hmm. and they learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of learning actually happens mm -hmm. through those near peer mm -hmm. learning, even in universities, even mm -hmm. in graduate school mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Do you have um, something to add on that about the gender aspect? Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with the idea that, uh -huh. um, so especially in mathematics, uh, females' uh, percentage is very, very low, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Japan, like maybe 3% or uh, six, actually 6% six uh, of the doctoral uh, researchers are female. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very low. And mm -hmm. sometimes we feel isolated and sometimes cannot have that mm -hmm. friends or, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think we need mentors or some kind of community to mm -hmm. share, mm -hmm. yeah, some ideas, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I myself was in among the boys, uh, mm -hmm. and I and, uh, joined the uh, International Mathematical Olympiad. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I enjoyed myself, mm -hmm. but still, if it's uh, homo 
genius culture, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you cannot say um, it maybe so if you have only one or two female uh, mm -hmm. in a class, uh, yeah, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to mm -hmm. speak out mm -hmm. actually. So mm -hmm. I think we need to increace the number mm -hmm. uh, first, mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, to mm -hmm. uh, have a more safety zone mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, female or gender minority mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah, and also it, it, uh, some research says that uh, mm -hmm. when in a competition, female girls tend to mm -hmm. feel discouraged somehow mm -hmm. um, to do a lot, and mm -hmm. boys uh, can be very encouraged to do the competition. But uh, if it's a kind of inquiry-based research or mm -hmm. curiosity-based research, sometimes uh, or social-related things, mm -hmm. uh, female tend to feel very happy or uh, encouraged to do more. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing is also important. Uh, and also one more, uh, the developer of the uh, events or uh, contests or are uh, sometimes old men uh, in Japan. Uh, not yeah. So I, I think the developers uh, also should be balanced somehow. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I guess one more thing that I like to add uh, mm -hmm. that I like to underline and, um, from both of you is that um, once again from the previous section mm. as. Um, the importance of curiosity, imagination, and empathy mm. were emphasized. And I think it's easy to think about mm. STEAM as a curiosity and imagination thing. But I was really struck by the fact that both of you um, emphasize the uh, empathy aspect mm. and the importance of that. And such goes on your example of the handbell and how yeah. they try to find out a way so that deaf to, people who cannot hear could enjoy it. That was just very inspiring and very um, interesting story yeah. about how the students learn how to be empathetic, not just by being told they have to be empathetic, mm. but through action, and that was especially mm. inspiring to me. And, and one thing that didn't come up, but I'm hoping that it could become in a, a discussion, I think mm. one thing that's interesting that we see post-COVID mm. is that um, technological um, aspects of education all of a sudden, out of necessity, mm. came more accessible. Um, in Japan, I think, and it might be the silver lining in a way that it does, it does enable some students who are otherwise not able to access things mm. and access programs mm. like you to access, and it just creates a different form of uh, getting together, and that could lead to more empathy and creativeness in a collective way, because I think another term that you both had was collective, and that, that I think is something that tends to be not looked at when we look at these very sophisticated methods. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're talking about were more collective and empathetic and collective. Mm -hmm. And that I thought was very interesting mm -hmm. from our discussion today. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, I'd like to open the floor mm -hmm. for, this, uh, for questions. And there's a microphone that will be reaching you. So please raise your hand and wait for the mic and, and um, identify yourself. Thank you. Yes. So um, like, yeah. So, yeah. And the next is Sakumasa. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious about the I think you need to turn on the mic or you need to speak into it. <laughs> yeah. There's an interpreter, so I, I think you. you need Thank to. You speak. Thank you very much. I'm Tilly Fong. I'm from the uh, the Chinese Scholar in the uh, Sky. It's uh, um, Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions. Uh, I have a question for and uh, uh, how, how to spell the name? I don't know. And uh, the, <laughs> the lady, Satchiko? yes. Yeah, um, yeah I, I'm wondering. It's it's very. Thank you for your pre presentation. I think it's so and. Um, impressed by the um, by what you are doing for the future society so uh, I'm wondering how this is a business is a company how what is the sustainability I mean and um, is there a business model or what, who are the your investors for it uh, yeah I, I like it I like it quite a lot I, I'm just uh, uh, thinking about the sustainability is, uh, is a business how it runs well or is it is it very popular or is something like that thank you 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, now we are kind of trying to challenge that kind of things uh, because uh, before uh, in Japan, I think education is more like a volunteer-based things and we cannot earn money a lot or something like that. But uh, nowadays we, need, we are aware that we need to have some more co-creative, sustainable ecosystem in the society. So that, we, yeah, so we need sometimes money to hire people and set up things and new mo technology. So I, I think we need more uh, engagement from the public sector, uh, I think, so like uh, text-based things. And also, and uh, what, why we are trying to use libraries or museums are uh, because uh, we think that we need to use public spaces uh, but it's all are they, they have some funds uh, to uh, maintain those kind of things. So uh, I don't think each school has a great uh, technical environment, for example. But uh, I think if you, you can use uh, those kind of public things as well and share uh, so common mm -hmm. things, uh, then I think it could be more easier. And also big companies. For big companies, they are now trying to uh, kind of innovate their business model as well. So sometimes it's, it could be, uh, we, we could ask them to uh, send some people to in, in those kind of things, or sometimes invest things, uh, uh, invest money to new challenges uh, in a school system, or maybe integrate it with other resources like a university or yeah, those kind of things. So I think there could be a lot of way to create some new business model in the educational field, but we should have many ideas and try it. Uh, yeah, that, that is the answer to your question. Yeah. Is it okay? So thank you very much for your great, great presentation. And I'm Kazunobu Sakuma from uh, APARC. And I'm a, a member of Global Affiliate Program. And I, I have some, uh, some experience in uh, educating uh, people in several schools. So uh, my question and cons uh, uh, interest is, I, I think um, uh, the challenge and uh, educational reform uh, to make uh, people more innovative and creative is how to, how to change the mindset of uh, those who grew up in the older days that received some kind of old style education that I focus on the memorize and to learn the uh, same way of learning or thinking. And so because um, uh, they do are um, engaged in education as a teacher or uh, sometimes they have a great power uh, to introduce some uh, new way to uh, education or some edu organization now or educational reform and uh, educational institution. So uh, my question is very vague and not focused, but um, I would love to uh, hear your idea to, uh, how to change the, to uh, change the, uh, the old people's mindset. So thank you very much. <laughs> I wonder if like who's invited, included in old people, but would you, would you start? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. I also study quite a bit about education reforms. <laughs> so I've been thinking quite a bit in terms of reforms that happen at the structural level, mm -hmm. as well as the regional um, levels, and then also at the local level. There are various ways in which we think about reforms, that it comes from policy, or does it come from the bottom up? Now, I'd like to share one very concrete example in which I think a reform is happening, and that is the case of Kyotangoshi. Now, we have a partnership with Kyoto. Uh, it's a city in Kyoto Fu, which is called Kyotango. And there, there are many visionary education experts. We work with the Board of Education. This is a public education system. Now the change makers at the ministry, uh, sorry, the Board of Education at Kyotango are so forward looking that we came in and it was such an amazing collaboration. What they are trying to do is to reform education. There are many challenges that they face. The population is decreasing. 
the number of schools is declining. Teachers are no longer as demanded, right? They are, there are not that many teachers who can teach in these classes or in these classrooms, or the number is decreasing over time. There are challenges that Kyotango experiences that are very similar to the challenges that other cities are facing in Japan. But what they're trying to do is to bring in something like we talked about today into their education system. And that is to work with the teachers. If the Board of Education says, let's do this, the teachers follow. If the school principal says, let's do this, then there is an opportunity for change. Now the students, how do they take this? The students are so malleable. They're so adjusting. They're so excited about these new opportunities. So it's not really the students that we need to change. It's the systematic, the system-wide, the, the structures of education. But if we work with champions, if we work with these reformers who are forward-thinking, very progressive in their ideas, they want to try something different. With the right leadership, it happens. So that is one example that I think is worth mentioning. Thank you. Um, I have this. Um, the, I'd like to ask Sachiko-san for the same mm -hmm. question, because one of the things that you presented in your slide mm -hmm. is the introduction of um, COIL, which is collab Collaborative Online Interactive Learning. Yeah. And if you're teaching at a university in Japan, somewhere in the higher ups are saying, you have to do COIL. Mm -hmm. And that we don't, we're, we're like, okay, we have to do COIL. What exactly is COIL? How, it's mm -hmm. really hard to do a um, new method introduce that into the course. So a, a lot of things you said were actually very useful to me. Oh, maybe this is the way I can do it. And I also think that mm. like, like top down is good, but like how exactly can mm -hmm. be really hard. Mm -hmm. So how to um, spread your ideas, both of you, for the way you yeah. teach, but, but sort of at the same time, teachers tend to be proud of the way they teach. So how do you make new mm. things and new methods mm -hmm. happen? Um, and what has been your experience? Because such goes on, I think you went to schools to do things, mm -hmm. right? Because they had examples. What has you, what have been your experience with the teachers there? Yeah, yeah. Are they happy they're there or do they feel challenged or yeah. uh, what is it like? Yeah, of course it depends on teachers and I okay. know that friends, uh, uh -huh. teachers, uh, are feel, can feel safe, safe mm -hmm. and feel relaxed and to challenge new things. But if you don't know the teachers mm -hmm. and if they think that uh, they are told to do so, mm -hmm. it's kind of sometimes, it, it's quite similar to children, mm -hmm. I think. So adults and children are very similar. Mm -hmm. So I, I think active learning for children should be also done for mm -hmm. teachers, I think. Mm -hmm. So teachers should experience those kind of active project-based learning or experience some new things mm -hmm. uh, in a safety zone, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe as you may know, uh, uh, Carol Dweck uh, uh, introduced the idea of mind, uh, growth mindset mm -hmm. and fixed mindset. And so mindset is how to set the mind. So I think we have both uh, mm -hmm. fixed mindset and uh, growth mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I think it's very natural to that you feel scared to challenge new, new things or, mm -hmm. or change yourself or mm -hmm. something like that. But if you kind of learn to set your mind to mm -hmm. be more, to feel more, find some playful things or mm -hmm. similar parts uh, in mm -hmm. uh, the things that you're mm -hmm. told, then I think you could be more mm -hmm. relaxed and feel more active or engaged in that. So it's kind of, um, yeah, um, conceptual things, but that still sometimes we have to do the uh, say that mm -hmm. kind of things. And also I think it's a value, uh, we have to value the weakness nowadays. Mm -hmm. in, in order to be creative, I think weakness could be the hint. Um, mm -hmm. So if you feel scared, that's very great because we can uh, find more creative ways to uh, change the world or something like that. So I think teachers should be, ha should have the safety zone first mm -hmm. and feel that they are okay and uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the first thing uh, we have to do in our next generation. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end of this session, but I think we're all um, inspired and very much waku waku by the two speakers. <laughs> so I hope we can yeah. convey our waku waku ness mm -hmm. to the next generation in any form that you might engage with the next generation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Please uh, join me in a round of applause to the thank two you. speakers. Thank, thank you so you much. Too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, we'll, we'll break. Mm -hmm. and, and lunch is available up there, so please feel free to pick it up. And uh, it's probably too, too chilly outside, so if you want to bring it in here, that's fine too. Either way, please enjoy lunch, and we'll uh, resume at 1.30 in this room. Thank you. And speakers can go upstairs for the green room.
order do you want to sit in? Can you hear me? Is it on? Great. Welcome back. Um, the third panel will be uh, on the future of democracy and digital media, and we have a wonderful panel right here. I'm going to introduce, uh, well, the, the session is set up in a way um, to feature Ken Suzuki and his uh, work uh, in the past and at Smart News right now. And then we'll have two dis discussions mainly. Uh, to comment and respond to Ken's uh, presentation and questions. Uh, so let me first introduce uh, Ken Suzuki. He is CEO and co-founder of Smart News, the global leader redefining information and news discovery. Uh, his life story and his career uh, is really part of the presentation that he's going to make, so I will not reveal too much about him at this point, uh, except to say that he's one of the most um, innovative minds coming out of Japan and his accomplishment in turning smart news into the, I think it's the second unicorn coming out of Japan. Unicorn being a um, private, privately held startup company valued at over US $1 billion. Okay. So Ken will present and, uh, for about 20, 30 minutes. Then we'll have comments from two of uh, the most distinguished colleagues of mine uh, at FSI who have spent decades writing about democracy in the world. Uh, we have Larry Diamond. He is the uh, William L. Creighton Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, the Moscow Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at the Freeman Spogger Institute for International Studies, uh, and other titles. Um, he's known as uh, Dr. Democracy or Mr. Democracy. Um, he has written widely on democracy in too many articles and books to list here. Uh, and his most recent book, Ill Wins, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacency, has uh, also been translated into Japanese, uh, published last year, uh, the Japanese version was. Okay. And then we have Francis Fukuyama. He is the uh, Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at Stanford University's FSI. Uh, he's also a uh, faculty member of FSI Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. He's also director of Stanford's uh, uh, Master's in International Policy. Um, since the widely read piece, The End of History and the Last Man, uh, Frank's uh, written broadly on issues surrounding democracy, political ideologies, social order, and international politics. And his latest book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, was published in English last year, and it's in the process of being translated March into... March 15th. March 15th is a publication day, so people watching in Japan uh, go to the store and buy their books, both of their books. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Ken, and he will speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, my name is Ken Suzuki. 
a founder and CEO of Smart News. A smart News is a smart, smartphone app that gathers information from around the world and uses humans and algorithm and humans algorithm to deliver quality information to the people. We launched Smart News 10 years ago in Japan, and it has been downloaded more than 50 million uh, worldwide. Now, here in the US, and Smart News is used by millions of people as a go-to app for news discovery. Uh, recently, uh, we received a global award at the Japan Startup Awards 2022. And this award is special to us because uh, it was given to us directly from the Japanese government. Uh, I'd like to introduce a unique feature of our product and related to today's theme of democracy, named News from All Sides. You can swipe left to see liberal leaning articles on a topic and swipe right to see the conservative leaning articles on the same topic. Many American voters actually used, used this feature during the 2020 election. Let me show you a video of one example during this election. If you go to the election page, which is also what I spend most of my time doing, you can pick a candidate that you want to read about. Usually I read about Trump because I feel like good or bad, the news is a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so usually I go on there and I use the little slider. Um, I usually either pick like a Democratic um, themed article or a Republican themed article because obviously they're really different tones mm -hmm. and I like to go back and forth and read both because I think then it lets me like make my own opinions more easily. Um, uh, if I'm... Have you tried the so, uh, slider feature? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've tried that. It's pretty interesting. It's interesting to see which sources, because like you can clearly see where the article came from in like the bottom left hand um, of the preview. So it's inter interesting to see the filter filter out certain news sources versus other people. Um, it just, I guess, is fun to show or just see like the different leanings politically of different like media outlets. So. I have been using it. Uh, this is specially, specifically designed to give users a wide variety of perspectives on uh, political content. A lot of political content tends to be ideologically driven, and the people tend to have a narrow viewpoint. <coughs> and why are we developing such a feature? Immediately after the 2016 election, Kai Magazine sounded the alarm with a cover that refers to the United States as a divided state. However, the US political division did not suddenly appear in 2016. As this chart shows, it was only the shocking presidential election that shined a spotlight on a problem that had been growing in the United States for the past two decades, according to Pew Research. In February 2016, in the middle of the 2016 presidential primaries, I started a road trip to pursue the essence of the issue. I visited various places in the US, especially our rural conservative towns that Japanese people do not usually go to, and talked to local people and asked how they deal with information and politics. Since then, so I have visited over 25 of 50 US states. What I found out is the reality of what is known as a biased intake of information, a filter bubble, or echo chambers. The cable TV, radio, social media, and the other media that we were exposed to were so close to our own ideas, so that, that so we became more and more polarized in our thinking. And even within small towns and families, there was a division. To solve this problem, news from all sides was designed to develop a function that would allow people to view information from a variety of perspectives. The person in the previous video is using it in a conversation between his parents and himself. 
as you know, America's so founding fathers preferred the term republic to democracy. But the value of democracy in America was rediscovered by a foreigner. Just as Alexa de Tocqueville, a French man, once traveled around the United States as a foreigner, he investigated American democracy and wrote a book about its greatness and limitations. I, as a person from another country, have witnessed democracy in America. I believe in its resilience and flexibility and hope to contribute to its future development. Now, US presidential election has become the largest security breach of the world order. Freedom of speech is supposed to be the strength of democracy. But foreign countries have taken advantage of it and are accelerating their interference in the digital space. The security breach revealed in the 2016 and 2020 elections have been exported to the world as a vulnerability of democracy and the skepticism toward democracy is spreading. Foreign political powers may intentionally spread fake news through social media, or fake content may spread as an accidental internet meme. Now, so generative AI will increase this risk. ChatGTP, a recent hot topic, is based on a deep neural network technology called large language model. In this quadrant, on, a, so on the right top of this figure, such generative AI allows for the large scale generation of low quality content. And since current social media algorithm judge this quality, first based on whether it is stimulating to users as an attention economy, they are not good at judging where, whether the content itself is trustworthy or accurate. Of course, the problem of such unreliable and inaccurate content is recognized. And detection of low quality content will eventually become partially solved through technologies. For example, how about making it mandatory for platforms to include an algorithm that puts an electronic watermark in text or images to prove that they are machine generated? On the other hand, what is essentially important is the generation of quality content on the right top of the, this figure. This is the most difficult part, but it must be solved. One of the reasons this is so difficult is that it's becoming harder and harder to pay for the generation of quality content. News Desert refers to the growing number of areas in the United States where there are no local newspapers. This is happening because of the rise of the internet has made the newspaper business model unworkable. Since 2005, 2,500 daily and weekly newspapers have already closed. And today, there are fewer than 6,500. That means two newspapers are disappearing every single week. According to Northwestern University study, 70 million Americans live in areas without enough local news to sustain democracy. It has been noted that if local newspapers that provide local news disappear, voter turnout will decline, corruption will accelerate, and fake news will spread. Thus, the generation of quality content is essential for sustainability of democracy. Although we are a startup, we recognize the importance of this ecosystem and have adapted a system that returns the revenue to providers of quality content. It is difficult, but we need an ecosystem in which they are incentivized to create high quality content. Yes, democracy is at stake but I believe technology can be used for the good of society. We must not neglect our efforts to achieve this. Technology is not putting democracy in jeopardy, but we need to deal with it well so that human beings are not swallowed up 
by the technology. The smartness mission is delivering the world quality information to the people who need it. This has not changed since our founding. We do not just deliver information. We must deliver quality information. But what is quality information? We often use the metaphor of the well, uh, healthy food. Junk food is full of sugar and tastes good. But if you eat as much as you want, you will damage your health. You have to think about the body and take a balanced and healthy meal. The same should be true uh, for information, which is nutrition uh, for your brain. This is our definition of, inform uh, of quality information. But social media is designed to get people addicted with doom scrolling that allows people to browse the negative content forever and the reaction buttons that stimulate the need for approval. Social media addiction is said to be more difficult to treat than alcoholism or drug addiction. If we continue to view only the information we want to see, we will damage our mental health, fall into fitter bubbles and echo chambers, and personal well-being will not be realized. We hope to change such a way of information intake and realize a world in which each individual has access to quality information. In order to solve the problem of democracy in the short term, it is important to support the generation and distribution of quality information from a variety of perspectives I have discussed. On the other hand, my spot starting point before Smart News was actually a research project to envision society 300 years from now. How do you think democracy will evolve in 300 years? Let me tell you a little about my origins. I was born in 1975, and the Cold War rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union remains a vivid memory from my childhood. When I was a middle school a student at the Japanese school in Dusseldorf, West Germany, I once entered East Berlin on a school excursion. Five months later, Berlin Wall suddenly fell and Germany became one country. At the time, I felt naive and uncomfortable with the way the boundary was drawn in this world. It became a powerful original expense and influenced my life as a researcher. After studying physics through undergrad school, I completed my PhD in a complex systems and artificial life and pursued the various interdisciplinary studies. And just 10 years ago, and I published a book titled Namelakana, Society and Its Enemies. This book is meant to be thought provoking. It posed a challenging question to readers 300 years from now. How is it possible to live in this complex world as it is complex? Let me explain that, uh, what that means. For human beings, it is too difficult to accept this complex world as it is complex. This is because humans have cognitive limitations. If human, humans were capable of unlimited processing of all vast amount of information, we might be able to handle a complex world as it is complex. However, when we are using the finite resource of brain, we are limited in our cognitive abilities. We cannot understand the world perfectly as it is complex. And if we cannot understand it, we cannot deal with it. However, the advent of the internet and computers offer a life history opportunity to increase this cognitive and coping capacity by orders of magnitude. I wondered if 
we could use these information technologies to design a society that would allow us to live in a complex world in a complex way. And in this book, I propose four new social systems, a currency system, a voting system, a legal system, and a military system. Today, let me uh, introduce two of them. The first one is so individual democracy. Modern individualism defines the nation and the state as a static relationship and assume that a citizen has a membership in one country. What if uh, you had a small stake in a different country or region and you could be a small voter there? Conversely, what if we were to have a democratic decision making across multiple countries as in a governance of a large river crossing several countries? We can think of the voting system that is dynamic and where, uh, where voters, uh, votes are propagated by multiple delegations, like Twitter's follow social graph. This is called digital democracy because this aims for changing our way of thinking about consistent individuals. The second is constru constructive social contract. The concept of social contract is a political theory that provides a basis for the establishment of the modern nation state. However, few people have the experience of actually concluding a social contract. The 41 passengers of Mayflower bounding for New England in the US created a Plymouth colony by signing a famous Mayflower Compact. It is considered a historical example of the social contract. And it was described by the Tocqueville as the origin of the democracy in America. And it's now the origin of the modern global democracy. But what if technologies such as smart contracts could actually create social contracts? And not just roughly as a Mayflower Compact, but on a more granular basis. I first proposed this idea as a constructive social contract in 2005, and 18 years have passed. The technological foundations for its realizations are gradually being put in place. One of my friend is trying to create a small community in a village in an Oito prefecture in Japan, where residents make decisions with smart contracts. All of these participants are going to be able to write smart contracts by Solidity programming language. Doesn't this remind you of a polymath colony 400 years ago? It is important to talk about big issues like the presidential election, but it is small, small steps that happen on the frontier like those of the polymath colony 400 years ago that make history happen. Innovation is made possible by living simultaneously in the here and now and 300 years into the future. And looking back 300 years into the present, you will be amazed at how simply people today see things. Today, it is a great honor for me to have this opportunity to talk with Raleigh Diamond and Francis Fukuyama and uh, who have greatly influenced my research interest. So to conclude this presentation, let me ask both of you three open questions. Number one, what can technology do to heal the division of America? The news from all sides that smart news is now providing will not be enough to resolve the division in America. <coughs> we need to create empathy in a scalable way to bridge the distrust between divided people. If you have an idea you'd like to see implemented in smart news or any other services, I'd, li I'd like to hear your suggestions. Number two, can we update democracy through technology? I see that people like William Weil, Vitalik, and Audrey Tan in the Web3 community have started a radical exchange movement. 
The proposals such as the quadratic voting are very interesting, but what are your thoughts on any attempts to fundamentally update democracy through technology? Is technology bad for democracy, or is this a great opportunity for the future of democracy? Number three, even in a democracy recession, where can we find the frontiers of democracy? We will need a frontier like the Primus colony. It could be a metaverse or DAO or Mars colony, but it does not not necessarily have to be the technology driven. It could be a village somewhere in the developed country or region in a developing country. Where can positive experiments on update of democracy take place? These are three open questions. I'm eager to hear your opinions on. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Ken, for this stimulating presentation. Um, so my job as the moderator here is to get out of the way as much as possible and let uh, three brilliant minds uh, who have thought about democracy for, for decades um, do their magic. Um, so uh, let's get right into the discussion, and I'd like to get uh, some reaction to the presentation, and we can probably also get into at least the first question. In, uh, you can integrate your response to um, one of those questions uh, in your comments. Uh, we'll start with Larry. Or Frank. Frank. Oh, me? Okay. Okay, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you. Well, so, um, Mr. Suzuki, that was really uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, we had lunch last week, and I downloaded Smart News, and I've been playing with it ever since. And so <laughs> I think I have a lot of comments on it, and uh, I think it's a really um, uh, extremely innovative and interesting app, and I think it has a lot of promise, and it actually fits with some of the ideas that we've had about how to deal with some of the political problems of democracy. So I, if you haven't done it already, I urge you to uh, uh, get that on your phone. Uh, I'm going to skip over the first question about what technology can do to heal the division in America, because I have no idea. Uh, I think that's a really tough question. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, number two and maybe number three. Uh, so the relationship of technology over the last, let's say, since the 1990s with the privatization of the internet has been very complicated. Uh, the trajectory overall that I think all of you recognize uh, is that back when the internet was first privatized, everybody thought this would be a great boon for democracy because information was a form of power and to the degree that you could make information free and easy to access, you would spread power out. And therefore, it would be a liberation technology, which is the name of a project that Larry was running for uh, a number of years. Uh, and then we found out that several things went wrong with that scenario. Uh, for one thing, um, people that didn't like democracy also figured out how to use the internet and to weaponize it and use it to undermine uh, people's um, confidence in democracy. But there's another process internal to the development of technology that I think undercut its pro uh, pro promise. Uh, so the idea was that technology was going to spread power out, but network economies and other kinds of economies of scale ended up concentrating power in exactly the opposite way. Now, in China, that concentration of power has come under the control of the government and the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but in the United States, it's come under the control of these very large uh, internet platforms. And the kind of power that is exercised is, you know, is, uh, you know, it's complex. So it doesn't exactly uh, destroy freedom of speech, but it introduces power into whose speech, you know, gets broadcast and whose speech is paid attention to. And I think one of the big problems is that the platforms that have onto which the responsibility for uh, regulating speech content has fallen are basically private companies whose motivations are 
uh, you know, their bottom line, uh, their profit-making uh, companies. They don't see their main role as the protection of democratic values, and therefore it's been misused, uh, as Mr. Suzuki has pointed out, in, uh, in quite a number of ways. And it's the concentration of power that I think should worry people that want to think about the relationship between technology and democracy. Uh, I think, what is it, this is 23 now, so it was two and a half years ago, I, I chaired a Stanford working group. We have a project on the uh, democracy and the internet, but I chaired a working group on platform scale, and as we started to think through the problem, uh, you know, most people that think about large-scale technology platforms are in the antitrust world, and mm -hmm. they're primarily worried about economic concentrations of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and our antitrust law, the way it's evolved, is entirely uh, meant to deal with economic harms that are caused by large scale. But as we started thinking through what this means for democracy, we began to realize that the real problem, I mean, that's a problem because concentrated wealth gives you concentrated power, but there's a problem beyond that which really had to do, in a sense, with the reach that the, pro uh, that the platforms had and their ability to both amplify certain messages and to take down others. Uh, and the criteria they used were um, not always ones that aligned with you know, democratic uh, values. Um, actually, Elon Musk, who I think has played a very unhelpful role in the last few months, the one thing he said that was correct was that freedom of speech doesn't necessarily uh, equate to freedom of reach. And what the platforms can do is vastly expand the reach of certain types of speech, uh, speech from certain people, so that in theory everybody has a right to say whatever they want, but not everybody's speech gets amplified. And I think a lot of malign social actors have seen that as an opportunity and you know, used it to bad effect. And so part of the reason for the polarization that was pointed to was that you know, a lot of the content that gets the most uh, uh, you know, hits and, and retweets and so forth is polarizing content because nobody wants to you know, amplify boring, centrist, you know, wise, you know, uh, uh, interesting, um, but conventional speech. They want to, uh, you know, go after things that are extreme or, you know, conspiratorial and the like, and that's part of the source of that polarization. So the problem for democracy is that concentrated power. By the way, takedowns are the, the reverse side of that because the platforms also have the power to either shadow ban or ban altogether you know, certain other voices. So it's both the ability to amplify at a scale that is unprecedented in human history, right? The printing press you know, in Europe, in a certain part of Europe, spread information very broadly at the beginning of the 16th century. The internet spreads it everywhere globally. And mm -hmm. so this is a problem not just for American democracy, but uh, democracy everywhere. And it's that concentrated power to amplify or to silence that is really problematic. And so when I think about updating democracy by technology, uh, it may require the reverse or sort of updating technology by democracy yeah. because I think that technology by itself is never you know, fully ever solved any set of human problems. It's only to the extent that our political systems and institutions can guide the technology and use it for socially uh, beneficial purposes that technology actually ever manages uh, to solve anything. If you don't believe that, just think about global warming and pollution and you know, all of the other things that are produced by industrial civilizations. And if you didn't have a regulatory system that tried to get that under control, uh, we'd be living in one of these you know, uh, science fiction dystopias already, uh, given the power of, of uh, a modern industrial civilization to undermine its own premises for existing. And so I think that the real task then is to figure out how to make those platforms less powerful in their ability to silence and amplify. So that's why that brings us to smart news because it does have this feature uh, that, was, uh, that, that you saw where you can swipe, you know, depending on the way that uh, you want to see the news filtered. And this is actually very similar to the idea that we came up with in our 
uh, platform scale uh, committee, uh, we proposed something we called middleware mm. in which you would outsource the ability to moderate content. No, so if you think about Twitter, Google, Facebook right now, they all have algorithms that determine what's going to get amplified and what's going to get silenced. And you have no idea what goes into that algorithm, right? That's one of their big trade secrets. They're not going to let you know why you're being served certain ads and, and not others. And, you know, that in itself takes away your agency. And so if you have the ability to actually say, well, I want to see what the Republican view of this particular incident is, or I want to see the Democratic view, that's good because that's returning agency to the individual user who should have had it in the first place and you know, was willing to give it up because it was so convenient to get you know, all this stuff on your, on your smartphone. Our idea was a little bit broader than what Smart News has done because we had this idea that you should have a whole kind of ecosystem mm -hmm. of content mod, uh, moderators. Uh, and you would have to do this through regulation because the platforms wouldn't give up this, pla uh, this power voluntarily. But if you could make, make it mandatory that every user of an internet service, of an internet platform, could actually choose uh, what kind of content moderation they wanted. That's the equivalent of picking on smart news, you know, what kind of news feed you want to see. But it could be broader than just liberal and conservative. You know, you could say, we want to see advertisements only from made in America, you know, products, or we want to see environmentally friendly, you know, uh, information. But to the extent that a user could actually tailor uh, what it is that came across their feed uh, and have and regain control over that, that would be good and that would decrease the ability to have a big platform make all of the decisions for you in a non-transparent way. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's good. Now, I think that uh, as we were talking about this, there's still a lot of problems because you don't want uh, unlimited choice in the way that your content is moderated. So, you know, you don't want to have a content filter that will say, find me the best child pornography on the internet, right? You don't want a, 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 a curator that will say, get me the most efficient bomb making, you know, videos that are out there, right? So there have to be certain actual standards. And this is why you know, Elon Musk, when he began his takeover of Twitter saying that he was a free speech absolutist, that in itself just made it obvious that he didn't know what he was talking about because you cannot have free speech absolutism on the internet. You know, there are certain social values that are so, uh, you know, uh, endangered by stuff that is out there that there has to be, you know, a certain base level of, uh, of content moderation. But in terms of political speech, uh, you get into these freedom of speech issues where it's not clear where the, you know, there's no social agreement on what the boundaries of acceptable speech are. But that's, a, that's an issue that I suspect Spart News still has to contend with. We were, we were talking about this at lunch. Mm. So if you have people that are denying the efficacy of vaccines uh, in the middle of a pandemic, right, is that considered out of bounds or is that you know, an exercise of free speech that should be uh, permitted. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a question that actually would have been answered differently two years ago uh, than it would be now, because I think actually now it's been recognized that, you know, the CDC wasn't always right about masking and, you know, certain of the guidance that they gave and opinion about that has changed because the science itself has changed. But that's an extremely difficult choice for any platform and any content moderator uh, to make. Uh, so, so I guess that's, you know, the way I think about it, that technology by itself, uh, it needs to interact with democratic institutions such that it actually fulfills the, pr the promise that it had, which is to actually empower, you know, kind of ordinary people, uh, every individual, give them back uh, the freedom of choice that has been taken away by the way that power has concentrated in the hands of a relatively few private, you know, corporations headquartered a few kilometers from where <laughs> we sit.
Great. Um, well, uh, I definitely uh, agree with what Frank has said with his perspective. And I also applaud the work of Ken Suzuki in this uh, extremely innovative and I think um, promising platform, I'd see, even say visionary. Um, although um, this is probably not a subject to be discussed on this panel, but um, I, I hope you're being commercially successful. <laughs> um, you know, the core problem is the one or a, certainly a core problem is the one that Frank has uh, mentioned, that the, uh, the business model of social media is deeply destructive uh, and um, socially and democratically harmful. Uh, and just so that everybody in this room leaves this room understanding exactly what that is, I want to take 60 seconds to spell it out. Um, most uh, social media companies um, derive their uh, revenue uh, from either, uh, well, bo probably both of two things, um, uh, collecting data and commercializing the data uh, of the users and selling ads both the sale of the ads and the commercialization of the data, uh, the revenue rises as people spend more time on the platforms. So from, you know, since the beginning, uh, the uh, purpose has been, how do you get people to spend more time on your platform? And what these social media companies uh, no, uh, probably knew from the start, but have been able to fine tune in part by hiring a lot of very smart behavioral scientists who helped to shape the algorithms is that the more you can get people to invest emotion, and particularly anger, outrage, shock, surprise, uh, and militant um, deeply emotionally invested engagement with the platform, the more people will spend time on the platform and the more money the social media companies will, will make. Therefore, um, the social media companies have an enormous um, commercial uh, and pecuniary interest in feeding content, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or uh, whatever it might be, feeding and elevating content to their users that provokes shock, outrage, uh, and anger, and greater, more militant, and even conspiracy theory theorizing conviction about something, the opposite of what you're trying to do by uh, giving them uh, more uh, Revenue. So I want to speak to the first uh, issue of what technology can do to heal uh, our divisions. Uh, but I want to begin by making some comments about what we need to do to technology or um, what we need to do to regulate and restrain technology and technology corporations. Uh, because unless you change the business model, um, I don't think we can get a handle on this. Uh, and I believe this is going to require far more reaching, aggressive regulation of the social media companies than most people are willing to consider. I think we need, at least need a very serious debate about whether Section 230 immunity for these social media companies should be lifted. There's now, of course, a, a court case that's probably going to wind up in the US Supreme Court uh, about this uh, that involves a lawsuit against, what is it, against Google um, for the harm it did uh, that led to, I think, uh, the allegation uh, that it led to um, uh, the suicide of a, a young girl who was driven to um, that's another problem, by the way. It's not just po polarization, but all of the mental health harm that's being inflicted um, by these social media companies. In any case, so um, 
be, before I get to the technology innovation side of it, um, I want to say we need more uh, legal and regulatory action uh, to get at a minimum uh, what my colleague here in the law school, Nate personally has proposed, uh, transparency in the algorithms mm. that the social media companies are using and the ability of qualified social scientists to get at them, analyze them, uh, understand their internal logic and their consequences. The second thing is, um, I wonder if you've thought about this, Ken, you've got a great product how do you persuade people to use it? I'm sure you're thinking about that. But I'm thinking about it not just in terms of advertising your product. I'm thinking about how do you socialize uh, social media users? And really, if we're talking about socialization, we should be talking about from a very early age to want to spread that dial around and get multiple points of view. And to know that they, if they don't do that, they are being fed and manipulated into a personally and civically and democratically extremely dangerous dynamic. Uh, and in this regard, I think, again, this is not really about technology. We need a whole new generation, not only for the United States, I'd say for, for every open society of civic education that gets young people to question the core <laughs> phenomenon of civic education. Skepticism, inquiry, rational debate, and again, moving the dial around to get multiple perspectives. So there is a really marvelous initiative here that's gotten um, traction um, from the School of Education, about you know, a five minute walk from here, uh, and something called, um, uh, I think it's the Social Science History Education Group uh, at the School of Education, led by uh, Sam Weinberg, uh, professor of education, and Joel Breakstone, who directs the um, the program, and they're simply trying to get, uh, it's a curriculum. It's not complicated, it's fairly easy to do, uh, that begins to get young people from a very early age to question <laughs> what they see on these platforms and break out of that downward uh, pillar of um, narrow information, and eventually from narrow information it's not a very long um, journey until you get to disinformation to step outside and question and search around and see what else there is. I mean, you've got an app and a dial that can enable people to do that automatically and get exposed to, to diverse um, points of view. So that's the second thing I wanted to say, that I think we really uh, need um, civic education uh, to prepare young people to want to use the kind of tools that you're offering. The third thing I want to say, I won't dwell on it here, is we're not going to get to healing the divisions uh, in this democracy without, I think, quite dramatic uh, institutional reform. Because the incentives, now, the, the Congress, you, you showed the, um, uh, the separation, I use that slide too, in American public opinion, uh, with the public separating, so we see left and less and less overlap between left and right in public opinion. I've got another slide that I show in, the, in, in my class that shows the separation in terms of the distributions of left and right, Republican and Democrat, in the U.S. Congress. Hmm. And when you look at the distributions of Democratic and Republican-leaning Republican -leaning members of the public, you see the separation and the reduction in overlap, but the overlap hasn't disappeared. In the United States Congress, it's gone completely, zero. And the reason why is because of the electoral incentives in the United States, the interaction of the current system, in my opinion. Uh, you don't have this uh, uh, in Japan. Uh, you've got, I think, at least a somewhat better electoral system there with the PR component. 
But in the U.S., the combination of... Um, How did you get that? Could you try again? <laughs> Is that me or you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm still not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea who's speaking. Uh, in any case, I don't think it's me. Um, <laughs> somebody's got an iPhone that is, at, well, this is another problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Social media has a mind of its own. So um, I think in this regard, um, we need very significant institutional reform uh, of the incentive structures that confront our politicians as well as our social media companies. Now, there is uh, another uh, innovation on campus here, and it is in a, f a little bit a technological innovation that I think is very much in the spirit of what you're doing that I think has some promise, and this is being developed, I'm involved in it, in the Deliberative Democracy Lab, which is now based uh, at the, uh, our center that Frank and I both once directed on democracy development and the rule of law. And uh, in, uh, in a deliberative poll, you draw together a random sample of a public. It's been done for the European Union. I think it's been done at one time in Japan. Uh, you can't do a constitutional amendment in Mongolia now without doing it. We've done it twice in the United States, and we're about to do it again in June on democratic institutional reform in the United States. You draw a deliberative poll, uh, you, you draw a public opinion, a random sample, you uh, survey people before without them knowing anything other than um, being surveyed on the issues, and then you bring them together to deliberate with balanced briefing papers, pro and con arguments on the issues, and an ethic, this is really crucial, of mutual listening and mutual respect. Uh, in a variety of small groups that people are um, broken up into to talk to one another about the various issues. We did this in 2019. It was the original America in One Room on five issues, including hot button issues like immigration, health care, um, the economy, and so on, taxes. And um, once people get in a room, deliberating with one another with some common basis of information and some common structuring uh, of the uh, discussion. Uh, and with pro and con arguments, we're back to what Smart News is doing in terms of uh, alternative content. You know, people do change. It's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. First of all, they wind up changing their views on a lot of issues. But second of all, they get out of the kind of Fox News, MSNBC foxholes and into, you know, initially pretty reluctantly, but over time, a little bit better listening to one another. And um, so the point is, I'll close with this, the technology component with the assistance of a computer scientist here, Ashish Goel, and a team of... Um, of students, advanced students, and so on, that he has uh, at his lab uh, in the School of, uh, or the Department of Management Science and Engineering, they've developed uh, an online platform for deliberation. It's a Zoom-like platform, mm. but it's got some very distinctive features. One of the features uh, that is actually very popular um, on this platform, and was particularly popular with the Stanford faculty, when we use this platform for the faculty to deliberate on the um, future design of the now created Door School of Sustainability, one of the features is that the platform limits everybody's individual intervention at one point to 45 seconds. People can't, and faculty really like that <laughs> uh, discipline on their peers. Um, so uh, the point is you could scale that up. Uh, and you could have uh, potentially, this is where we hope to be headed, large numbers of people deliberating, this is the key, with diverse others, not their peers who already agree with them, on a wide range of issues. So it's sort of like taking your dial mm -hmm. and going to the next level. Okay, now that you've had 
um, diverse sources of information, can we talk about it? Mm. Uh, and I think that's not a very technological, but it is an innovation that can make use of technology for scaling up uh, and lowering costs that I think may have a little bit of promise. Wonderful. First, um, it's wonderful to get all these um, great endorsements from the two of the greatest uh, uh, minds thinking about democracy. But I just want to mention that uh, this conference is not sponsored by Smart News. So this is a spontaneous <laughs> <laughs> endorsement from two scholars. Uh, and then I'm sure Ken has a lot of reaction to what was said. And especially, I, I'd like you to focus on the issue of how to moderate, curate mm -hmm. news. And I think Smart News has some functions, yep. some hybrid kind of mechanism of combining algorithm and, and human touch. Uh, so you can talk a little bit about it. And then in that discussion, if you could integrate some of the issues that Larry particularly alluded to, the commercially viable, sustainable enterprise. How, how can smart news become that without um, filtering everything out or making it completely free? Yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for the great so uh, responses, and uh, so I'm so impressed. Um, the, I think maybe um, there may be three the important factors to the manage this very serious issue. And one is, of course, maybe the, the, the government level or regulation level or platform level or media level, the second one. The third, le third level is the people. And maybe the, these are maybe kind of a triangle to accelerate this maybe serious issue, other than maybe political division. In that sense, maybe, so um, by maybe changing the one factor, so we cannot fix the problem. In that sense, maybe all three factors need to be fixed. And uh, in that sense, maybe, and uh, I'm, I'm a person in a private, uh, private, uh, uh, so private company, but maybe we need a kind of regulation in that sense. But as you know, the maybe freedom of speech is so guaranteed at the Constitution. It's very hard f for the government to regulate the content itself. In that sense, so we need a kind of the, the uh, maybe, as maybe uh, Frank said, uh, kind of the uh, middleware or kind of the, uh, the middle company the, between the government and the private sectors. Like a, something like a, so the, and the audit company, the same. So maybe the, the accounting, the accounting the very important, but uh, I think maybe the government doesn't check the accounting of the company by themselves. But some middle company can the man, maybe manage how they moderate. And we need a kind of the, the maybe the a kind of the sector to manage between the government and the private sectors. So, I, I, so my advisor is so, uh, either X or maybe Google and who uh, created um, maybe trust and safety and the moderation field at Google. And he, he built a new company called Trust Lab. And uh, so such kind of so company, so try to, to create a kind of the, uh, the middleware, our platform to, the, to buy them so, so the platform can use those kind of platform to manage the moderation. Because the moderation itself is very hard, it's not easy. And so recently, as you know, the Twitter, so they off the many moderators, and then the quality of the, the content, so yeah, is worse, getting worse. In that sense, maybe for the platforms and uh, maybe moderation is a kind of a headache. And uh, so I think maybe we need a kind of the, 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 the regulation and then does that support and enforce the those kind of platform to change their way of thinking. And then without that, maybe I think, as you know, and uh, hmm, the, if the, there is no regulation, maybe the company that so doesn't have a good so moderation can get uh, more money. <laughs> it's a trade-off, but it's not good. We need a minimum regulation in this sense. And then, so in smart news, so uh, we have a human editorial team and, uh, and managed by the Stanford alumni. <laughs> and so I think maybe professional journalism is very, very important to keep and uh, the, the, our content quality. And then the collaboration between the machines and the human is the best. That's our thought. But recently, as, so I explained, so ChatGTP or maybe the AI 
uh, it dramatically so changed the situation. Maybe we can, so the written so chat GDP is used for the making a new low quality content for the search engine optimization or something like that. But uh, I hope maybe we can use this kind of technology into the moderation as well. And so, and so second part is about the, uh, the about the maybe rally so uh, question and uh, I think my sustainable business model is, so, is very important for the sustainability of the democracy in that sense. And uh, now, so the uh, smart news is so uh, the revenue itself is so, uh, is created by the other business, at the same as uh, the, the social media company. But uh, I think maybe we need a, so additional, the revenue stream in addition to the business model in the future. And uh, so I, I cannot so guarantee that so as a CEO at this conference, but uh, so uh, we should think about it. And so I think maybe the, maybe the problem of, of the maybe other business model is maybe if we can, we can get so more time spent so we can get more money. That's uh, maybe the strong issue. And then so the, the most of the so platforms, so algorithms, uh, try to maximize, maximize the time spent. So the f most well-known case is maybe YouTube. So YouTube is maybe the, the highest KPI, the, the most important KPI is the time spent itself. And so I think maybe, and uh, that's so, uh, and uh, the motivation to increase the time spent makes the, the, the platform to so decrease the effort to reduce the low quality content and then in Japan, YouTube is, is used as a uh, maybe a kind of spread machine of, for the conspiracy theory, and it's a huge problem. And uh, not uh, not, uh, not not just uh, YouTube. So any so platform has the same problem. But I think maybe so and uh, uh, so this is a huge problem for democracy. And then the building strong business model is so important for platform. But at the same time, and uh, the building business model for publishers and the content creators is more important. <laughs> and then, so I think, uh, so the most of, so, uh, as I said, as a news desert, and uh, maybe publishers cannot make so the revenue. But recently, as you know, the subs subscription model has so, uh, the great success in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or some several the publishers, but still, and uh, there's a very a huge problem for most of the local newspapers. And uh, how to support those so the publishers and content creators is very, very critical. And once we lose this kind of, so, capability by the journalists and the, so the news companies, so it's very hard to recover this so maybe capability as an organization. And uh, I think maybe we need to think about the kind of this support, like a European countries, yeah, as a government level or something like that. Yeah, there's so many topics, so, uh, uh, so I, I want to so discuss, but maybe time is limited. And, uh, I think maybe the, thank you very much for uh, giving me a very good so the suggestion about uh, maybe the derivative so and uh, democracy and uh, as a platform and uh, yeah I, I will think about it I want to know more about it yeah thank you wonderful I, we should probably open the floor for questions unless uh, you have additional response comments okay then any questions from the audience. I'm happy to say more if no one has any questions. Well, go ahead. There's lots of different ways you could go on these issues, but I had one question for Larry. I guess you talk, talked about the business model being at the at least one important element, if not at the heart of the issue which is basically trading um, uh, data um, for free service and then the data is used uh, in the way that you mentioned that undermines dem democratic values. My question, I guess, is it goes to that basic uh, thing. Do you, pe do you think people would want to give up the free service of Facebook, Google, YouTube, um, uh, or would government be able to do that politically uh, to, give it to basically force people to give up that free service by essentially um, Restricting the use of that data by the platforms because that's what would happen if the, if the data if the data was restricted, 
that they could not use that personal data, then the business model would be broken, but so would the revenues and so would the free service. Is that a politically acceptable deal in America? That's a good question. Um, I don't uh, know enough about uh, the revenue structure of the big uh, uh, social media companies to know whether we would be talking about breaking the model or breaking the companies. <laughs> there is a difference between the two. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, Europe has gone much further than the United States uh, in terms of regulation, and um, they're still operating in Europe. So uh, I think we could go further, too, and um, people are not going to want to pay, I think, generally, uh, a great deal of money for uh, these services. Uh, but who knows? I mean, there was a time when we thought people wouldn't pay for television. You know, we're probably of a generation, right? More or less in common. And um, we got CBS, NBC, and ABC coming into our homes, and then PBS. And you know, who, who would have been willing to pay for getting broadcast television? And now most Americans do pay uh, you know, for cable television service. So, um, it's, not, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that um, people would pay for access to these uh, platforms. And in some cases, the, I think the platforms are already moving toward that model. The question is, would they pay enough to make up for the lost revenue uh, that would come from the dislocation of the other model. I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's a very important question. Actually, economists have done these studies about how much uh, people value their privacy for, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not, not very much. encouraging, right? Yeah. I mean, for a few dollars a month, they're happy to give away everything. But, <laughs> but the reason that um, the Europeans can do it is that they don't see privacy simply as another good that you can trade off against a free email account, that it's a fundamental right, and therefore, you know, they can regulate that even if people don't necessarily, you know, uh, aren't willing to protect their privacy, you know, pay very much to protect it. Uh, so I think, you know, they've just got a different view of the importance of privacy as kind of constitutive of what a modern individual is. I, I want to take advantage of my position here and, and explore a couple more issues. So Frank talked about how smart news is this dialing thing, is giving back agency to users. Mm. Now, another question is uh, what do users need to, need to know? How, how do they need to behave? It is a user literacy kind of issue, because mm. even if they get the agency back, do they exercise the agency in a constructive way toward a healthy democracy? That's another question. So what mm. kind of user education uh, is needed in that Yeah, regard. so that's a really interesting question. You know, this is where a lot of the behavioral economics probably will give you some insight because it turns out that people, including me, are super lazy, you know, and there's all these dials and settings about privacy and so forth that you can use as a social media user. And, you know, even for me that, you know, I, I, I pay attention to this stuff, but I just, don't bother to you know set the settings mm -hmm. properly because you know I don't want to take an extra five minutes to figure out how the thing works, or even sixty seconds. <laughs> or even sixty <laughs> seconds. And so I think that you know the way you'd have to design the systems is to make it uh, you know to to put those choices in front of people you know front and center before they can actually start using the service. They really have to make some commitments as to how they want to see it structured. And in fact, I guess I saw that when I signed up for Smart News, like you have to indicate what your preferences are in terms of the kinds of news that you, you know, uh, that you see, and then put those choices, you know, make them very clear uh, and user friendly uh, so that, you know, people really understand that they do have the power to change what, uh, what they see. Because otherwise, they're just going to pick the default, and then we're back in the world that we're in right now. 
and open. Uh, microphone on me. Thanks very much. This is extremely stimulating. Um, I actually have two questions. One may be sensitive, but could be very brief, maybe in your answer, uh, understandably so. And then second is kind of maybe for other perspectives on the panel. One is, um, have you, this is the sensitive part, have you gotten pushback from media outlets in terms of labeling their content as one side or the other of your app? Um, and wondering how you deal with that if you, if you have. And then the second is, um, is there international content on your app in terms of the coverage of the BBC or another you know, international news agency? And is that something you've considered adding in order to add maybe a third part of your swipe <laughs> at that point? Yeah. And is that a good idea, I guess, is really for the panel? So uh, that's a great question. Um, the so, so far, so we didn't, so we haven't received such, such a maybe the negative reaction from the publishers. So, because I think maybe the most, maybe in the US, so the, the maybe, I think maybe stance is very, maybe, uh, maybe the stance of the media is uh, very maybe clear. And uh, so, and uh, there's no such kind of so negative reaction from the publisher. And uh, so we actually have a partnership with the BBC and uh, so you can you can read the BBC content on smartness and the other maybe some European the publishers and uh, you can read it and uh, yeah and uh, that's also a very important so uh, maybe viewpoint because maybe in the US maybe polarization is maybe kind of the one axis but uh, the world as I said the world is not so simple <laughs> it's so complex the multiple axes and dimensions of perspective is so important that's the reason why we we. Uh, didn't say news from two sides, news from all sides. In that sense, maybe, yeah, we should improve the, uh, such a perspective and uh, adding a new axis to the product, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, Facebook revealed that of its content moderation budget, 80% of it was being spent in the United States, which means that 20% was for the other 180 countries around the world. And anecdotally, you know, there's there are plenty of places where these companies have actually supported, you know, Duterte in the Philippines or Modi in India, you know, by the content moderations they've taken, the decisions they've taken, and uh, we Americans just don't pay attention to that. Uh, and so I think there is a huge international problem, you know, with the way that these platforms, you know, make these decisions. We probably have to close now, but I just want to quickly ask if, uh, if there's a way for smart news to incorporate Larry's uh, deliberative democracy, like 45 seconds intervention kind of idea, is this something that's easy to integrate into the current smart news app? You have to think about it probably, but uh, quickly. Yeah, that's a deliberation <laughs> issue. You don't have a deliberation component. Mm -hmm. But I could see how the two could be grafted together yeah. in very exciting ways. Yeah. Let's start discussion, yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Great place to end. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, well, please give a, a round of applause to your wonderful panel. So we'll have a uh, 30 minute break. Um, you probably wanna stay, I mean you can go in and out, but you probably don't wanna leave the building because it might be complicated to come back here. So. Uh, if you could try to be in this area, that would be helpful. And you can all stay for the next session. Great.
こちらがいいんじゃないこちらがグッドアフタヌーン、ウェルカムバック。The moment we've been waiting for. <laughs> All right, Yoshiki san is here. We will start with.、Uh... Right. We will start with a video introducing Yoshiki san. So please. When it comes to pop culture, we rely on Dan Harris to keep an eye out for the hottest new sensations. And he found a band that in Japan is bigger than the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Bruce Springsteen combined. Yoshiki is a huge star in Japan. So big, he has his own branded Visa card, and he's the first person ever to have a Hello Kitty doll named、Please、after him. Welcome our very special guest today, Yoshiki! The Hollywood Foreign Press Association chose a Japanese rock and roll legend with the first time. The first time, 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 the first
it's, um, it's hard to put into words how excited we are to have you here, Yoshiki-san. You can see it in tears of some of the audience members' eyes. Um, and I've never, been, uh, I've never imagined that I would say these words uh, here. This is something I've been dreaming of. Welcome to Stanford, Yoshiki-san. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, the person who made this all possible is Ambassador Ichiro Fujisaki, who is a rock star in his own right in the world of <laughs> diplomacy. <laughs> So Ambassador, Ambassador Fujisaki has occupied a number of important positions at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan uh, before serving as a Japanese ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2012. And I uh, understand that that's when uh, Fujisaki, Ambassador Fujisaki and Yoshikisa met. Um, he has since taken many important positions at leading universities such as Sofia and major corporations such as Itochu. And he is currently the president of the America Japan Society and president and CEO of the Nakasone Peace Institute. Uh, so with much, much gratitude, uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Fujisaki to moderate this session. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tsutsui, uh, for a very nice introduction. Uh, some 50 years ago, I was strolling on the campus of Stanford. A few predicted that I will come back here as ambassador of Japan. Very few, but there were some. But no one predicted that I will come back as a moderator for world rock star. <laughs> so, but today, I know that this is not my show and Yoshiki's show. Uh, also, uh, also, when I retired from diplomatic job 10 years ago, ambassador of Japan to US, I said, now I can say anything. <laughs> My wife said, but dear, no one cares anymore. <laughs> so I know that I should stay croco today and wearing like this, but I think to speak, maybe it's better to have the mask off. Yoshiki needs no introduction. There's a saying that a person needs no introduction, but he really is the one. He's the worldly musician and entrepreneur. Uh, now, uh, what uh, comes up to my mind is that uh, this is his first appearance to, as a keynote speaker to major university. So Stanford did it. Congratulations. <laughs> Someone was already weeping. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, today, you know what day is, today is. It's Emperor's birthday in Japan. And Emperor's birthday, uh, let's talk about Emperor. I know that Yoshiki has special relations with the Imperial family because I run America Japan site in Japan and in 2017, we made a video in that I asked Yoshiki to put a message to that. And I brought it to then Emperor and Empress, now Emperor Emeritus and Empress Emeritus. And they saw it and said, oh, Yoshiki-san, it's very gladly. So I thought, wow, really, uh, they uh, love this uh, uh, rock star. And uh, as we have seen in video, he has composed, he was asked to compose a song, uh, music for uh, and their 10th anniversary of enthronement, and he played it in front of uh, Emperor and Empress, and also it was televised nationwide. Everyone watched it. So can you tell us a bit about your relations with that uh, uh, Imperial family and uh, the anniversary song, please? Okay. 
So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's such an honor for me to be speaking in front of amazing people. And then Ambassador Fujisaki-san, thank you so much for being my friend almost a decade. Um, we met in Washington, Washington DC, 2000. 12? Yeah, and uh, we met in LA as well. Los Angeles yeah, too, yeah. that's right, that's right, yes. So yeah, I'm so grateful uh, to be here. Okay, the question, uh, when I composed the piano concerto for Emperor of Japan, 10th year's anniversary uh, of his reign. <laughs> well, to be honest, I was shocked, because <laughs> I've been, you know, I was since just rock star, <laughs> not like a, you know, it's kind of was very strange in a positive way. So, but my background, actually I started playing classical music. I'm studying classical music when I, when I was four years old. They started playing rock drums when I was 10. The reason I started playing rock drums, um, I was just practicing and playing classical music, listening to classical music only. But my father passed away when I was 10. So. Then my mother bought me a drum set <laughs> because I was going through some painful moment, anger and everything. Uh, my father actually took his own life. So then I started you know, practicing rock and playing rock and everything. Then I became rock star. But I was still practicing, you know, playing classical music, composing cl cl classical music. So then the moment, the, the year, I was asked to compose, you know, for the um, for the emperor's piano concerto. Um, my band, some people may know, um, is called Ex Japan, so it's a rock band. Um, disbanded that year. We got reunited in a year late, years later, but also one of my uh, best friends slash the member of Ex Japan passed away. So I was going through like a you know, painful time again. Then because of those, so many painful moments with the bands and everything, just I was gonna quit being an um, artist. I was gonna just concentrate on becoming a producer or something like this. Then I was asked to compose, not only compose, also perform. It's like, wow, our life is very <laughs> strange. So there's something you know, I asked my mother, um, what should I do? You know, should I go back um, to the stage to perform? I'm, I feel very honored to, do, you know, to be asked. Then, so I did it. So that was kind of like a life-changing moment again, not only playing in front of an you know, amazing um, emperor and empress. At the same time, that day I decided to go back on the stage again. Thank you very much. So uh, the em uh, em emperor then and empress then uh, sort of gave you the encouragement to go back as to a musician. And as you said, you started music very early. And I read that uh, when you were in grade school, teachers said, ask the students what you want to be when you've grown up. And he wrote, rock star, <laughs> and the teacher was very mad and scolded him, saying, you write something serious in this essay. And he said, I'm serious. So she scolded him more. So, but she was uh, scolded him, but he was downright. After several years, at the age of uh, 15, he gave uh, the first concert, and 17, he, you became pro. So you were very successful uh, uh, musician already, but you decided to move out to LA. Uh, why was that? Uh, if you stayed in Japan, you don't think the door would open to the world? And if I may ask, why LA? not uh, New York or uh, uh, London, nor San Francisco or Palo Alto. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, first of all, the, yeah, when I was, you know, um, junior high or elementary school, junior high, high school, yeah, like uh, teachers, actually teachers asked them, you know, we have to like just write down your, where you're going to be, your occupation or something like this. <laughs> yeah, I said rock stars. A rock star from the get-go. Yeah, they are so mad. <laughs> like, can you be something, you know, can you write something more realistic? Like, yeah, I mean, I'm coming from some kind of countryside. They are, you know, uh, called Chiba Prefecture. Um, then my place, the, the where I play, uh, coming from is Tateyama. So it's like um, countryside, so no musicians or no rock star. <laughs> so yeah, it's very, uh, people, uh, teachers, so very, very unrealistic that could happen. Even, even in Japan around that time, so I would say 30, 40 years ago, rock star was not even an occupation. It's something, you know, didn't exist at that time. <laughs> so I just kept saying that. Um, I just knew something, I could do something. I don't know, just the, um, just believed in. Anyway, so then you know, several years later, uh, I think we, I, we, our band made it to, I would say, you know, one of the biggest bands in Japan. But at the same time, um, there are much bigger mountain to climb, I thought. You know, so then coming to Los Angeles, I mean, Los Angeles is kind of like a center, Hollywood, the center of the entertainment industry, right? So I would say New York is more fashion driven. Um, so, so I wanted to, you know, how do you say, pursue our dreams, like American dream. Uh, so I decided to come to Los Angeles, yeah. Uh, how did you like the uh, life there? Uh, uh, it must be not easy to start when di you didn't speak language and also uh, the food and everything. Uh, and now, I think, after so many years, uh, you're so used to uh, American life. What, what do you like about America? Uh, for example, what kind of uh, music, movie, uh, food, uh, anything you, or other things you like about America? Um, you know, I love Japanese food, so, but in Los Angeles, you can get pretty decent Japanese food, so <laughs> that's not the problem. Um, the one thing I was shocked, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm trying to be humble, yeah. so um, I can walk, down, walk on the street mm. without people recognize me and faint. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is good. <laughs> yeah. Um, then also, you know, I realized, you know, there are so many people around the world, you know, coming to Hollywood to pursue their dreams. So, so, so I was like, wow, I can learn a lot of culture in, of course, in American culture, to you know, so Los Angeles is a kind of very melting pot, you know. Yeah, when I came to Los Angeles, um, almost that was late 20, when I was, you know, most close to 30, I spoke zero English. <laughs> like, wow, I need to speak English here. So, <laughs> so I studied in the past, you know, intensively in two years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said. Uh Chiba is a countryside, and not to degrade uh, Chiba in any sense, but uh, in order to sell land there, they invented a word, Chibafornia, following California. <laughs> really? <laughs> tried to send. Was that so? I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Wow. But, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, do you advise now young Japanese artists to come to the United States to really go into the world stage like you did. But of course, not if, if you come, that doesn't 
of, uh, promise any success, but uh, rather than staying in Japan, is that, do you think, better to do that? Good question. Um, when I came here, it was not that much, like how do you say, social media or uh, internet was not that popular. So these days, you can be your own city or your place anywhere in the world can you know achieve your dream i think but to come here to you know come to um, america then you feel how do you say, i don't know how to say it's like feel the vibe of the air and everything it's something you can't do this just through you know social media or something like that so i would recommend to you know um to doesn't have to be us or uh, Europe or, uh, you know, so to, to, if it's a center of the fashion or something like this, go to Paris or uh, Milan or London, or if you are pursuing the um, entertainment industry. So I would say Hollywood, yes, mm -hmm. I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Now, my third question is that, uh, you are successful in so many things. Uh, in music, you are composing music, you are a classically trained pianist, you are a rock uh, drummer, and you're a leader of X Japan, and now you won the last rock star. And also, uh, not only in music field, you do other things, uh, like you produce wine, you produce champagne, you produce energy drinks, and uh, you pre design Baccarat glasses to drink them as well. Uh, and also you design, uh, you're a fashion designer, uh, model yourself, you design kimono, because your uh, family was a kimono uh, store, and also you, uh, design things like sensu. I have uh, Yoshiki oh, sensu. Really? And, uh, <laughs> this is uh, my birthday gift from my daughter. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, and besides that, uh, you uh, produce uh, t television as well. And you, it shows that uh, I don't have dementia. I have a pretty good memory, don't I? Uh, so you do many things. So successfully, and uh, you challenge new things. I think you like challenges, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, do you decide just by yourself, or do you go around getting advices of others? Do you have good advices? Uh, I was wondering how, how is it, and also if if you think you made some mistake. Do you get up middle of the night thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that? Do, does <clears throat> these things happen as well to you? Completely. I think I made so many mistakes. I failed so many times. Mm -hmm. It's like a, when do you, how do you say, draw the line, you failed. I just didn't draw the line. I, say I failed. It's like, if you decide that within 10 years I will accomplish this, within 10 years or five years, if you didn't get to, if you didn't get to the goal, so probably you would say that. But I kind of like, a, how do you say, time frame, I think like throughout my life. So once something didn't go the way you want, uh, or like what, you know, the society might say you find kind of failed, but in my own mind was just a stepping stone to go to the next step. So I just didn't give up. Um, and then I still don't give up. Um, it's kind of, you know, um, painful story, but yeah, when I lost my father, I was like, why did my father give up? He gave up on his life. Mm. 
was like, then I, you know, I loved him so much. Um, I was like, when she then started thinking, was I was already 10 years old, or already, uh, only 10 years old, I was like, hmm, what's giving up me, you know? So then at that moment, I said, hmm, I won't give up till the moment I need to give up. So if you take that kind of <laughs> theory to whatever in your life, you can't give up. Not only for, for myself, for my friends or for people who I love, something like that. So I can't give up. So that, then I started doing all those things. Just, you know, those designing kimono or fashion or uh, producing wine. This happened somehow organically. Um, you know, I'm not really pursuing the business side. I just, I love drinking wine. <laughs> so might as well create your own wine. So, or I love, you know, fashion, something like this. So those things happen organically. But once I started doing this, I was like, okay, I'll try to make it happen. Just, you know, then, of course, that's a lot of things didn't go like, you know, well. But at the same time, I was like, okay, I learned this. So now go to the step two, step three. So, and I'm still doing it. I think you have a great taste for uh wine or design, other things, so that you know that this would be loved by others as well. And you try them. You like challenges. And uh, as you say, you don't give up so easily and pursue. Now, if there are people who would like to do startups here uh, or do some business, do you have some advices following your line? When, how to pursue your objective? Uh, when to sort of decide to change course or modify or whatever? Of course, uh, uh, it needs courage and it needs preparation and, of course, funding as well. But uh, if you can give some advices, I think they'll like to hear because you have been so successful in so many areas. Uh, I'd like to hear it. Maybe it's a little too late, but I'll first uh, try to listen to that. Well, um, it's like, what should I say? It's like believe in yourself. Like um, <clears throat> when I was, you know, uh, when I lost who I love, or well, when I was going through, when I was going through some pain, I was just, existing, not living. That was just like telling myself, regardless, you are still breathing in this world. Might as well live like a rock star. So I would say, be your own rock star. That, you know, whatever you do, just believe in yourself. That's I can say. Thank you. Uh, this uh, mm. symposium is on future of social tech, nurturing skills and markets for social impact innovation. On uh, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, some people say that there's, there'll be a day of singularity <coughs> where AI can do everything uh, better than human, but uh, you have been a musician and entrepreneur. And uh, from uh, those angles, uh, how do you look at AI? <laughs> okay, uh, before I came here, I was asking chat GPT. <laughs> 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 if Yoshiki, give a speech at Stanford. <laughs> what would he say? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I, you know, uh, Chad GPT gave me a lot of like, advice. <laughs> so then, you know, I was thinking, what would AI change in terms of the you know, art world? You know, like uh, such as like, you know, if you are 
painter, so Dali <laughs> is changing a lot of like, you know, this winning award. Uh, music industry, there's a Google uh, Music LM, uh, some kind of uh, AI generative, uh, you know, uh, thing you can use to compose music as well. Um, yes, um, the answer, I do not know um, for the future, but also, you know, people talk about singularity. Mm -hmm. That could happen. That may not happen. That was to think, start thinking, like uh, all those big data, right? AI, is, AI start learning, coming from us. It's like, um, okay, so if the human humanity is it meant to destroy ourselves. AI will do it faster. If humanity is meant to support and love each other, I think AI will support us. So <clears throat> we should just, you know, let's live, you know, to like uh, support each other and, and love one another. So then when singularity moment comes, AI will support us. That's how I think. Because they are, AI is start learning from the big data that's coming from us. So, you know, <laughs> that's, yeah, they, or AI will become so smart to stop us destroying ourselves. Thank you very <laughs> much. I'm okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> now, Yoshiki is, is very much into philanthropy. And uh, the first, uh, really, uh, I think that was the first time, was the time we met in Washington, D.C., was uh, on those occasions, <clears throat> uh, a group, Hands on Tokyo, was uh, having a, uh, event in the embassy of Japan, and uh, Yoshiki was good enough to come here, and everyone was excited. But uh, every time when big disaster happens, or natural disaster, whatever, he's there, uh, really in person, or uh, sending a huge contribution, and it's really, that's uh, noticeable. And uh, can you tell us why uh, you so much into Philanthropy. Um, I think helping someone also helps you. It's like, um, yeah, like um, it's kind of like a selfish way, but I like to help people. <laughs> That's that me doing this, actually helping myself. Sometimes I was like, like, why do I exist in this world? I got, but as long as I live, I'm helping someone. That fact is actually helping myself. Not, you know, it's like, um, I have to admit, again, from, the, from the, the moment my father left this world, I kind of have like a, you know, like a, like a, that wish is ish is not that strong, but you know why do I exist? I'm always asking myself. As like, but again, when I'm supporting people, like wow, I can still be in this world. Then you know, so that's why actually <laughs> um, I'm doing a lot a charity. Also, that's also saving my life at the same time. Thank you very much, uh, uh, but it's very impressive, and please do continue. And that, now my uh, question is that uh, you have attained so much, uh, and, but still you are trying new things. For example, you started champagne recently and credit card, as we have seen, and... Uh, uh, 
you have started the new group of uh, the last rock stars as well. You never stop. And uh, don't you think of uh, slowing down sometime? You have some, if I may say, health problems from time to time. Don't, uh, don't you feel that you should uh, sort of uh, restrain yourself? But uh, how do you think about sort of going? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just very grateful, you know, uh, people ask, ask me or we can collaborate or we can, you know, pretty much every day I'm asked to do something. Um, I just feel very grateful, you know, people like I need me to do something, so, yeah, it's like, mm, yeah. So uh, you think uh, you will be going like this uh, from now on as well. <laughs> and that's very good. Uh, it's encouraging to hear. Uh, but I'd like to do more charity. Like, um, it's, um, yeah. I want, once watched uh, television, and on television show, you were talking with a junior high school girl she asked, a Japanese girl asked you, what should I do be, be doing? And uh, your answer was very st sort of standard answer. Concentrate on your studies now. <laughs> and I, I, oh, I thought, wow, that's a very... <laughs> and you also said, uh, uh, you now speak English, but uh, because you didn't do that uh, when you were young, you had a, a rather hard time uh, studying English and you still con continue to study English so to the young girls do study and uh, um, also, also you call yourself amateur of uh, music although you're a classically trained pianist now uh, here at Stanford the most famous commencement speech was from Steve Jobs. And as everyone know, the last word was, stay hungry, stay foolish. I'd like to ask, uh, I should have asked to chat G uh, GPT, <laughs> GPT before, but uh, I would ask him, what would Yoshiki say to Stanford students? Uh, what's your message, like uh, what Jobs said? Uh, uh, for for their li for their life, they have uh, in rea really maybe not too hungry, not so foolish students, but uh, still they would like to hear from you the advice. <laughs> oh, see, they are what having the. <laughs> <laughs> so I already said it actually. So also you know, having several conversation with ChatGPT. <laughs> I decide, yeah, so I would say, again, also telling myself to the same thing, but the word be your own rock star. That's the. Be your own rock star. Be your own rock star. How? <laughs> Just, the, you know, believe in yourself. Yeah, so, uh, I see. Yeah, hero is, you know, within you. It's. Like when I was thinking, like um, when I was, you know, okay, whatever, competing for anything, or just trying to create the um, amazing music, was practicing piano, or practicing drums. Then, or I was just going through some hard time. I was like, who am I fighting? And I think just you're fighting towards fighting with your weak side of yourself. Like you have to beat that person within you, right? So I just think if you believe in yourself, so you can <clears throat> conquer anything. And it doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. It's not only for young people, middle age, and old people, too. I don't think so. I don't think so. so. Um, I have a good friend. He, uh, he's, um, his name is uh, Yamanaka. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, uh, IPS. Shinji Yamanaka. Yeah, he's a very good friend of mine. <laughs> I asked him, how long are we going to live? <laughs> Oops. 
I okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll hope the camera was not on. <laughs> so he said at uh, that moment, like 120 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you think about that, uh, you are still, you I know, see. yeah. See. Um, we're still very young. Um, well, it depends on how you want to live your life 120 years. I see. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, I would say, you know, never too late to yeah. uh, start anything. Also, you know, as I said, um, I wish I studied English when I was like, you know, much younger. So I didn't have to go through and, you know, every day recording 12 hours and six hours of English lesson every day for a few years, you know, when I came here. So that's why I said, you know, I was on TV, some, you know, um, a lady asked me, you know, what should I do? Study right now while you can. <laughs> okay. Now I think you come here to ask questions. A lot of people have questions to Yoshiki. So don't hesitate to ask. And they have foundation uh, video too. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Charity Foundation video too. Okay, yes. Before mind. we uh, go, uh, we'll see one more video, okay?
we will take uh, questions. Uh, please uh, uh, say it in English, uh, very, but uh, because of the time constraint, let's make it brief. And uh, uh, please say your name and uh, questions. Uh, ra raise your hand, and if I point, uh, 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 someone will bring microphone to you. So please stand up and uh, say your name and uh, ask your question. Uh, uh, I think I would like to give uh, opportunities more to students uh, uh, here. Uh, you raise your hand, this uh, gentleman here? Yeah, okay. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Shin. Thank you for uh, setting this um, event. Um, my question is, um, can you share us your um, daily routine to keep yourself motivated or um, before like a, to give a, a great performance? How do I motivate myself, daily, daily routine? <laughs> um, okay, I'm like a very like a night owl. <laughs> Okay. Um, mm. um, it's like um, I almost think like I don't hope it's a positive way. It's like uh, today is my last day, right? It's like every day. So what if there's no tomorrow? What would I do? Because uh, some people just like uh, think about future or think about the past. But what about, what, what, how about this present moment? So I was like, OK, there might be no tomorrow. So let's live as much as, as, much as I can. That's kind of how I might motivate myself. Because my experience, you know, I lost not only father or my band members. So, so that's, I don't know if I answer, you know, makes sense what I'm talking about, but yes, try to, okay. try to leave that this moment as much as I can. Okay, okay. the gentleman there. Hi, my name is Hiro Otaki the school, from School of Medicine. Thank you very much for coming to Stanford. And then I have two questions. One, how do you get inspiration for the new things like a, New instru you know, new piece or new your activity or like a philanthropic things. How do you get the inspiration of new things? That's one question. The second is maybe all of you agree you are so charming. How what makes you so attractive? <laughs> well, uh, am I what? Attractive. attractive? <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. I think <laughs> he got it, but. Uh, uh, this was exception, but uh, let's keep your question one person to one because there are so many people here. Uh, but uh, he uh, asked you two questions about uh, uh, where do you get your inspiration. Second was uh, how do you make yourself so attractive? So, <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for saying that. <laughs> okay, so um, I think again, you know, over. Uh, decades of creating music. Why do I create music? Again, try to save people's lives. So I, I try to do something for pe you know people. I, I, my music can stimulate something people to become positive or uh, helping people, or something like that. Including myself, I started writing, composing music after my father's death. I try to keep myself alive. Try to keep myself motivated like to, to create music. I think I do philanthropic work and you know and creating music kind of the same thing. Try to motivate myself. So again, I said so many times this a session, why do I live? Maybe because of, as long as I'm live, I'm doing something, I'm helping someone. So through music or through charity you know philanthropic work or so that's how I motivate myself. Um, it's like, yeah, um, it's strange. It's like, um, you know, people <laughs> talk about GDP, right? Gross domestic products. Is that uh, 
those are the words should measure the world. Number one GDP, US, China, Japan, blah, blah, blah. Should we concentrate on more like a national happiness? Like uh, this is gross national happiness, GNH or something like that. You can come, come up with it. How happy you are in this country can be. Because again, I you know, went through rockstar life. I had 10 Ferraris or something like this. Or, you know, Rolls Royce or a crazy house. That fact made myself happy? Not really. When I helped people, maybe people say thank you or arigato, like, wow, that really makes myself happy. Then that's, um, you know, I'm still learning what exactly the purpose of this life, but I think one thing is for sure is helping people. It very really motivate myself. And uh, to make yourself attractive. <laughs> 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 well, I eat well. <laughs> I don't sleep well, but um, yeah, I work out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw the video that you were working out so vigorously. <laughs> yes, I don't have an answer for this, but <laughs> thank you for saying this. Okay, okay. okay you, you raise your hand, yeah. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for coming to Stanford. Actually, uh, I'm Anna Matsumoto, undergraduate sophomore at Stanford University. I have one question. Uh, whenever you come across with, uh, like, you know, when you face the some mental break, how do you get over it, or do you just gonna make it part of your life? When I face uh, when, some when difficulties when you have and mental, mental break. difficulties, some uh, problems, uh, how do you sort of uh, get over that uh, difficulty that you are facing? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I'm still facing this kind of, you know, every day. Like, uh, um, um, yeah, first of all, I, you know, all my, whatever the pain, I just try to write l lyrics. Also try to convert it to the melody. Um, yeah. Oh, that, that's probably my way of sharing my <laughs> pain with uh, people. So, yeah, if you just, you know, how do you say, don't talk to people or don't do anything, it gets kind of too much, you know. So, yeah, um, I don't think I overcame the pain of losing my father or losing my friends. I'm still dealing with this. Put it this way, I'm, I'm still bleeding, right? If it's a physical pain, the, the bleeding sometimes become, became, like, how do you say, well, eventually became a like, scab or something, it was the stop. But the, uh, mentally, if you're bleeding, you never stop, actually. Um, so, the way of me of trying to overcome overcome for that kind of problem is put everything into art to, you know, yeah. Then eventually I'm hoping that art or melody I create can help people, something like this. So that's how I try to overcome my... Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Please. Hello, my name is May. Um, thank you for coming uh, Can you here. take off your mask? I can't hear you. <laughs> um, my name is May. Thank you for coming here and speaking. And my question is, how do you deal with nerves? Hmm? I'm sorry, um, I couldn't get it. How do you deal with nerves, like when you get nervous? Do you ever get nervous? <laughs> the, um, the answer is obvious, no. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, yes, sir. I, yes, yes. Um, so let's see if I go on a stage, right? Playing, I mean, it can be in front of 100,000 people or 500 people. Um, so uh, when I played for, uh, when I played at Carnegie Hall um, a few years ago, I played with, uh, with the orchestra. Um, I was very nervous. 
like, wow, you know, I'm playing at Carnegie Hall, pianist, also composer. Um, but so I practice a lot, <laughs> like, like as much as I can. So then I didn't become nervous at all. <laughs> it was funny though, when I was playing the Carnegie Hall, actually, I said it on my MC talk, when I, I, I said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> actually, I used to have a condominium next to Carnegie Hall. Or by walk. <laughs> I was supposed to say practice, practice, practice. <laughs> anyway, so yes, um, if you don't, if I don't practice enough for any show, or so that show becomes just fear, right? But if you practice your, enough, so then everything becomes so, how do you say, entertaining and then exciting. So I think um, it's you know, depends on the, your definition of you practice a lot. Uh, it doesn't have to be like long hours or like, or how much you can concentrate, but I think to prepare for something like this. So that, the, my answer is I don't become nervous because I practice a lot. Because uh, for example, just like we've seen, on the 10th anniversary, you composed a song and played piano in front of the emperor and empress, and that was nationally televised. So that's a big thing, too. And uh, you weren't uh, uh, nervous for that. Actually, song. yes, I was so nervous. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, I was kind of shaking. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was semi confident in terms of my composition. But uh, yeah, the performing part, yes. Now, uh, uh, I have taken from this side, not much, but uh, it's okay? Shall I pass? Uh, yes, please. Hi, Yoshiki. I'm Yuya. Thank you for visiting Stanford today. Can you put your microphone closer? To oh, yeah. Uh, so the, my question is like, make, when you make decisions, uh, what does your thinking, thinking process look like? Like, what are the most important things for you to make decisions? Thank you. Um, good question. When I make a decision, I kind of like narrow down the, you know, the answers. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Again, I keep saying the same thing. If I do this, this uh, is this going to be good for the world? <laughs> that's like uh, eventually, whatever that, you know, sm small thing. But if, so that's, uh, you know, I, when I make a decision, um, yeah, it's like I almost have no choice to do this. Like, um, yeah, I'm selective, I, I, though, you know. I, I don't do everything I've asked to do, <laughs> but yes, when I make a decision, that's like, hmm, I have no choice not, not doing, uh, doing this. So I just... You have been producing wine and champagne. Is there a possibility that you would go for sake one day? <laughs> 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 or whiskey? Or... <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, also, you know, I love music, that became my occupation. So I love drinking wine, <laughs> so that's kind of became, you know, um, my business too. Um, I just have to like sake or whiskey first before I decide to do, get into this business. You, you don't know. I, I do, I do love sake and whiskey, but just, <laughs> but. Um, okay, okay, we, we, let's <laughs> stop it. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, the uh, gentleman in the red sweater. Hello, uh, I'm Masaki. I'm a graduate school of education. Uh, my question is, I think you already accomplished so much. You have money, fame, and status. And uh, my question is, uh, what do you want for it if you wish you could? And are you still hungry or are you satisfied already? Uh, uh, is he still hungry, or is he full, and uh, thinks so that what do you he, want he has attained, or 
do, does he want to go for somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, um, yes, I'm very hungry. <laughs> Not literary, but <laughs> 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 I, I didn't eat breakfast today. <laughs> but, but in terms of life, yes, I don't think I accomplished the, you know, um, yet. Yes, I'm nowhere near household name in the States or our world. So, yeah, I would like to pass on my dream. Like, um, yes, I'm uh, still practicing piano every day, composing, um, and working hard. Yes, very hungry. Now, I have gotten questions from students now. I would not like to limit that now. Young at heart, who used to be young or whatever, uh, please uh, do, don't uh, hesitate to raise. You are young, so I won't <laughs> give you the chance. I would like to give chances to some people. Uh, would you like to? Aren't you a student? Oh, uh, this is a, I was a diplomat once, so uh, I, I can say compliments. I'm sorry, please, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Miho from the Japan Society. It's a non-profit organization and providing a program um, that, um, educating, you know, the, building the relationship between Japan and the U.S. And my biggest challenge is uh, fundraising. Um, the, especially like uh, Japanese people don't tend to have a charity mindset. Mm. So what made you motivated to do the lots of you know, charity activities um, in your life? Um, interesting. Yes, uh, every time I donate, I get somehow, because also I, I state that I donated to, you know, uh, let's see, recently I was support, I'm supporting the people who, who had to move, who lost their home in, in, because of the war in Ukraine, Russia. So um, I've been supporting that cause as well. But every time I, I say, state that in Japan, like, why don't you do it quietly, <laughs> right? People say that. Why do you have to say it? Well, two reasons. One, because of, I donated to that cause of our Red Cross, or our, people want to know that something's happening. Of course, they, obviously, people know what's happening. But sometimes when I donate for climate change issue, or blah, 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 so people want to find out this is, this is what people, you know, is happening in this world, they, they need help. Um, also, I would like to motivate uh, all those artists or celebrities to have more, you know, the donating kind of like a charity mind. Yes, uh, uh, when I came to the U.S., I was shocked in a great way. A lot of uh, celebrities involved with this, uh, a lot, uh, se several charity calls. I was like, wow, that's great. I would like to bring that culture into Jap to Japan. I mean, Japan, there's a thing called wabi-sabi, something you can do it quietly, which is beautiful culture. I respect that. But, but in terms of charity, I think people can, you know, be out loud and then spread that, the, the mentality that I would like to do. So for among, doesn't have to be celebrities or to everyone, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyone else, please? Uh, uh, not student? <laughs> uh, someone a uh, uh, little elder? <laughs> uh, the gentleman with the uh, glasses over there? Hi, Yoshiki-san. Thank you so much for coming to Stanford. My name is Eijiro. I'm kind of old, but you know, um, <laughs> already graduated from yeah, Stanford Business School back in 2006. And uh, yeah, actually, I'm already trying to be a rock star. And then I'm now, you know, not in the music, but you know, I'm now running a matcha company. 
matcha Japanese green tea. Okay. And then as you already you know promote the champagne or other beverage business, do you have do you have any advice <laughs> for the how to promote matcha? I mean, you know, matcha is obviously really healthy. So you know, you, you have any advice or you know <clears throat> promote more Japanese you know authentic you know culture to the state. So you love matcha business. Uh, you, you, you run, yeah? That's, that's great. Um, yes, uh, if I were doing this, uh, if to be doing the running your business, I would say um, I would stud, study, of course, you've probably done as much as you can the benefit of drinking matcha, right? Like um, make you feel uh, just like anti, how do you say, uh, uh, age, age, like, right? right? It's like a, make you feel look young, right? So I would probably provide your matcha to some celebrities, influence, influencers around the world. Okay, you're gonna give it to me? Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, I will promote that, okay. So yes, then, you know, first also taste good, and then uh, you're trying to expand your business to the world, yeah? Okay, mm -hmm. yes. Um, then you're, you're running this in, in the States? Okay. Yes, uh, there's a, um, I mean, also the way you, you drink matcha sometimes, right? There's a, some ceremony thing you can use that to, yeah, there's a billion ways of doing that, kind of expanding this business to it. Um, um, but first of all, do you love matcha? Okay, that's most important, right? So, as, so just tell people how much you love matcha. That's, that, that's, that's very authentic. So that's, I think that, you know, the, your passion for loving matcha, as much as you can spread that, your, your passion, that's the most important thing I would say. Thank you. I'm afraid that uh, now, Yoshiki will be flooded with matcha, <laughs> sake, shoyu, whatever. <laughs> please uh, recommend, please taste. Now, uh, two, uh, what, what does it say? Two minutes? Okay. Uh, uh, those people who, why don't you, this lady here, yeah. You're a student? Okay, not yet? Maybe. Uh, hello, my name is Erin Tsui. I'm 13 years old. I'm daughter of Kyoto Tsui. <laughs> and um, my question is, what is your advice on, especially to young people, on how to find their passion or their purpose in life? <laughs> Thank how you. How to find the passion, passion. in projects? Okay, um, you know, again, I'm also trying to find the answer every day, you know, um, um, but so, so there must be a reason we came to this world, right, basically, like uh, we are born, right? I mean, um, so, so I try to be very grateful um, I'm here in this world. Um, so if you think that way, um, then you have pretty much anything you, 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 can, uh, you can do, right? For, for it's your choice to pursue your dream or you want to be something, you want to become rock star or, or you know, anything you would, you would like. So, we are just, we are given this kind of like opportunity to be living in this world. So, um, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> so, your question is? Uh, how to sort of promote your passion, passion. in this, any project. Uh, yeah. How do you yeah. find your passion? So, again, you know, uh, this society has a lot of like, um, you know, how do you say, to give you, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, or why don't you become like that, or, you know, there are a lot of 
you know, uh, opinion and, and, and everything. But just what I do, I just, just get rid of everything, then be yourse by yourself and then try to think, what do I want to become? Like, um, well, first of all, again, I said, I'm breathing this world. So what do I want to do? Then, again, my, my situation, I was like, I want to help people somehow. Somehow. Then what am I good at? Well, I love music. Then I'm compo I can compose. You know, it doesn't have to be a musician or composer. You can be um, athlete or anything, you know, or, or doctor or teacher or whatever. As long as you're trying to make, <laughs> it's kind of a cliche, but you know, make, try to make the world a better place. So you find your passion. Yeah. So. I think uh, you encouraged a lot of us here. Uh, let's be a rock star. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 we would like to thank uh, Yoshiki for giving uh, all his uh, thinking to us. So uh, I think this is the end of our session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yoshiki-san and Ambassador Fujisaki. Uh, Yoshiki-san, you also helped me with uh, parenting my daughter, so that's really <laughs> fantastic. Um, and um, really, this was such a meaningful, insightful session, and uh, thank you for sh really sharing deeply personal stories as well. Um, uh, be your own rock star, that's really a motto to live by for all of us. Uh, it's one thing to be your own rock star, it's uh, quite another to be a rock star for other people, uh, much less tens of millions of people for decades. So it's been wonderful to have you here. It's an honor for us to host you here. And uh, thank you for being Yoshiki. Please continue to uh, stay being Yoshiki. Uh, and uh, with our gratitude, we'd like to present you with this uh, frame, Stanford uh, um, diploma looking kind of frame. To uh, invite your super fan, uh, she's been your fan since she's uh, four years old. To give you some uh, Stanford swag items to present. Four years old. Since she was four years old, when she went to rock. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you came to my concert when I was four years old. Yeah. <laughs> your mother or your father brought you, right? Wow, wow, yeah, rock and roll father. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What's, what's inside? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Stanford hat. Perfect. Stanford wine glass. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And this whole conference wouldn't have been possible for, uh, except for our wonderful staff and uh, our Japan program. Uh, Program officer Kana uh, Lin Panko would like to present Ambassador Fujisaki uh, saying swag. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, this concludes our conference, the 40th anniversary, uh, APOC uh, 40th anniversary conference. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and please give another round of warm, warm welcome, I mean, thank you to Yoshiki-san and Ambassador Fujisaki.